Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Deforta. I am the Deputy Director General for Land Planning in Martinique. And today we will travel at the heart of biodiversity in Martinique. And here is uh, alongside me Felix Guimard, the president of the Regional Natural Park of Martinique, and Mr. Lado, the president of the Commission for Ecological Transition of the Territorial Collectivity of the Martinique. And uh, here you can see that we have uh, speakers uh, who are in Fort de France. It works for sports, so it can work. It can work for us as well. So we will hear from our local partners in Martinique. And here alongside me, Madame Crillon, the uh, director of the uh, Natural Marine Park of Martinique. I give the floor to the first speaker. Good afternoon. It, I am delighted to be here and I would like to thank the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Thank you for letting the Natural Park of Martinique to be represented here. And And I would like to thank everybody who is here and everybody who follows us online. I also would like to welcome our partners who are in Fort de France. The delegation of Martinique is here and we will make today a presentation about Martinique. It's biodiversity that is a, a natural heritage we need to preserve and to manage. It is a really rich uh, area, and my colleague Marcel Nadeau, the representative of the uh, Martinique Collectivity, the president of the uh, Commission for Sustainable Development. The, mm, so we have here different uh, different bodies represented. And the government services are here today. They are represented by uh, Madame de Porter. The overseas uh, have 80% of French biodiversity. Nature is everywhere here in the Martinique. Our landscapes are diversified. They have a breathtaking beauty. And I am always proud as the president of the regional nature park. I am always delighted to see that the UICN has acknowledged our natural area, has uh, recognized it and placed it among uh, 100 uh, unique sites for uh, biodiversity. There are so many living organisms in our island, and that is why we have decided to uh, join the World Heritage List to be part of the future of uh, French nature. And we want all our landscapes to be part of this World Heritage uh, List, and we will uh, promote our application in July 2022. I hope that Martinique will join the World Heritage List. That is why I hope a Congress such as this Congress can one day happen in the overseas, or why not in Martinique? That's an idea. On behalf of the representatives of the uh, committee in charge of the Martinique Natural Park, I would like to thank you all for being here today. Uh, I would like to thank you in advance for supporting our application, our candidacy. I will to join the World Heritage List. Thank you. 
Thank you for our island. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, all participants. I thank you for being here or online. Dear representatives of collectivities, uh, me, ladies and gentlemen, to the representative of the government, dear partners, dear institutional partners, dear technical partners on behalf of the president of the executive committee of the Martinique Territorial Collectivity, Mr. Serge Rachemi, and on behalf of the president of the Assembly of Martinique, Lucien Salibert, and on behalf of all uh, the uh, elected politicians of uh, our territorial collectivity. I would like to tell you that it is an honor to be here today alongside the president of the regional nature park, Felix Sisman, and alongside the deputy director of the IDL Martinique. I am delighted to be here for this great event for nature. It is, uh, we need to be here because we are part of the overseas and we have a breathtaking biodiversity on land and on the sea. We have a rich biodiversity and a rich geological a rich uh, wealth. L I'd like to stress that the Caribbean islands are part of one of the 34 biodiversity hotspots you can find worldwide because they have a unique biodiversity, a biodiversity that is unfortunately threatened by uh, human activities. It is therefore obvious that we face a loss of biodiversity. Two, this loss of biodiversity threatens all the services rendered by nature, that is soil productivity, pharmacopy, the use of water, water use, and so on. We know now, especially since we are in a pandemic, so now we know that we need to improve the connection between man and nature. We need to change the way we see uh, other living organisms. We uh, need to uh, find this biodiversity to regain it because it is necessary for us for our quality of life or for our day-to-day -day life. Martinique uh, Territorial Collectivity supports a strategy for biodiversity and more specifically to preserve and to promote our natural heritage, a unique natural heritage. And yes, our collectivity is committed to protecting biodiversity. We are taking the lead in managing biodiversity and we own a huge woodland area that was granted by our uh, former regional uh, council. We want to promote our uh, natural forest areas and that's the reason why we will open many areas and many pedestrian uh, pathways to the public. Our collectivity makes a contribution to help preserve precious areas on land and on the sea, and it has created and manages protected natural area. For example, the Marine Reserve Albert Falco, a preacher at, and it, it, uh, and this is this marine reserve was created a few years ago and we are created another one and that was already awarded the Eiffel Palm in 2012. We also have other projects for preserving and promoting our natural heritage. My colleague already mentioned it and we uh, uh, want to uh, classify volcanoes and forests on Mount Pelé. We want them to join the World Heritage List and I hope 
hope we will be successful. We will uh, get an answer in July 2022. We have uh, two uh, very brave uh, taking forests that uh, were awarded the uh, label exceptional uh, forêt d'exception. In 2018, we also have a unique site in the south of Martinique and has been uh, classified and is one of the most visited uh, sites of France. We undertake all this project with many uh, partners, among them the Natural Park of Martinique, which is a major uh, actor and plays a crucial role for preserving nature in Martinique. We also have a, a natural marine park here represented by Jessica and represented by uh, uh, by here by Jessica. It was created in 2017 and represents a very major management tool for protecting marine environments. Beyond these uh, measures, our collectivity wants to reinforce its commitment and engage infra regional partners. And together, we want to take concrete measures for biodiversity. We will use the TUN tool, meaning territory committed to nature, and this measure will be implemented in the coming months. Beyond these tools, the only tools, we, what we need is a political we will, or our local actors for land planning, industry, transport, all together, we should, we should work towards preserving the biodiversity. And we are ready. We are convinced that we need, since our ecosystems are so fragile and unique, we are convinced that it is pressing to implement all the policies I mentioned, as well as all the tools that will uh, help make it possible for us to reach these goals. So after this introduction, thank you for your attention and thank you for listening to me. And before turning towards the next speakers, I'd like to thank you uh, once again. Thank you for listening to me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um. Voilà, nous allons poursuivre. We are going to continue. Bonjour, donc euh, Hello. il s'agit donc, euh, donc nous sommes en duplex depuis la Martinique. We are calling une présentation à plusieurs voix entre la CTM, euh, les deux parcs et puis l'ADM. Présentation parts. qui donc euh, se déroule en trois temps, une histoire géologique euh, euh, brève hein, et récente, hein, euh, les valeurs de la biodiversité de la Martinique. Et We're puis, les, un focus sur, évidemment sur les outils de gestion euh, qu'on a à disposition euh, pour gérer euh, toute cette biodiversité, cette richesse naturelle. Diapositive suivante. Donc, euh, une brève histoire géologique, comme je so l'indiquais. La diapositive suivante. Donc, au départ, les terres, évidemment, n'étaient pas émergées et c'est vers 50 millions d'années euh, avant d'avoir un hotspot écologique. On avait bien un hotspot géologique hein, dans ce secteur des Caraïbes au niveau de l'arc des petites Antilles. Donc euh, des points chauds qui résultent euh, évidemment d'une de la subduction, c'est-à-dire l'enfoncement de la plaque atlantique sous la plaque caraïbe, donc à l'origine de cet arc volcanique, euh, à raison euh, d'enfoncement de 2 cm par an. Hein, donc, et la Martinique, particularité, est la seule île de cet arc volcanique où euh, l'histoire la plus complète affleure. Vous avez sur la petite carte en bas à droite figurer les trois grandes étapes euh, de manière très simplifiée hein, de la formation de la Martinique. En jaune, les formations les plus anciennes, donc, le, le, donc au, au sud et à l'est, avec la presqu'île de, de la Caravelle, qui voyez se détacher sur le fond noir. Euh, et en vert, les formations les, les, les plus récentes, hein, sachant que le volcanisme est évidemment toujours très actif euh, sur ce secteur de, de, la, de la Martinique, en particulier dans le nord et, et dans le nord-est de l'île. 
Donc l'érosion a ensuite façonné euh, très rapidement tous ces édifices euh, volcaniques, hein, qui sont des véritables puzzles euh, de, de volcaniques. Hein. Il y a de multiples volcans, en fait, hein, en créant notamment du relief et des paysages qui sont propices au, au développement de la végétation et évidemment de la flore et de la faune par la suite. Et l'histoire continue, diapositive suivante. Donc la biodiversité euh, martiniquaise, euh, je vais, je vais l'évoquer euh, rapidement pour vous et euh, on en reparlera par la suite sur les, les valeurs exceptionnelles qui sont liées à la candidature euh, au patrimoine mondial. Diapositive suivante. Donc la, la Martinique, le fait de cette diversité euh, des, des périodes géologiques, présente une grande diversité de milieux, tant au niveau euh, marin qu'au niveau terrestre. Euh, on y trouve bien évidemment des récifs coralliens de grande qualité, des herbiers et des mangroves. Euh, au niveau terrestre, euh, on a euh, différents types de milieux, et notamment des milieux qui sont très peu euh, présents aujourd'hui sur euh, les autres îles des petites Antilles, notamment la, les forêts sèches et les forêts mésophiles, donc qui se situent principalement entre le littoral et 400 mètres, 400-500 mètres. Ces forêts sont plutôt bien préservées sur les massifs du nord de la Martinique. On y trouve également sur les massifs les plus élevés l'étage hygrophile, donc les forêts humides, et tout à fait en haut des pitons du Carbet et de la montagne Pelée, ce qu'on appelle l'étage altimontain, avec des forêts d'arbustes, de broméliacées et de, de fougères. Donc une grande diversité de milieux qui, qui est associée à la grande diversité du terrain et entre le, le sud et le, le nord de la Martinique est liée notamment aux différences aussi d'hydro. La positive suivante. Donc la végétation, euh, pour exemple euh, altimontaine, euh, on y trouve des espèces euh, assez rares comme le colibri à tête bleue que l'on ne trouve que sur la Martinique et la Dominique ou la lobate de la Martinique, euh, endémique stricte de la Martinique. Euh, cette euh, végétation, ces, ces forêts sont très bien conservées. Euh, on les trouve principalement euh, sur les pitons du Carbet, la montagne Pelée. Ils sont essentiellement en forêt public. Diapositive suivante. La forêt mésophile, c'est la forêt quasiment la plus riche puisqu'on y trouve à la fois des espèces de la forêt sèche et de la forêt humide. Euh, donc plus spécifiquement euh, entre euh, 400 mètres et 800 mètres, euh, plutôt dans un bon état de conservation avec néanmoins euh, des, des, des secteurs qui peuvent être menacés par euh, les défrichements et l'activité anthropique, avec un niveau de pluviométrie un peu inférieur à ce qu'on trouve sur l'étage altimontain. On y trouve euh, euh, dans, dans, dans cette forêt euh, des espèces comme le matoutou falaise, la migale de Martinique, le cerisier montagne également, ou encore euh, la chauve-souris, l'ardops des petites antilles. Diapositive suivante. Euh, au niveau marin, euh, on trouve des herbiers dont l'état de conservation euh, n'est pas très bon puisque seuls 12% des points de vérification euh, sont bons. Euh, on y trouve des espèces comme le lambi, les oursins blancs ou encore les tortues vertes, les coraux. Diapositive suivante. Et donc les récifs coralliens, euh, dont l'état de conservation euh, est moyen puisque 40% de ces coraux sont considérés comme dégradés euh, dans l'étude des records de 2021. On y trouve euh, des espèces comme le mérou de Nassau, l'acropora, cervicornis ou encore le, le perroquet. Voilà, les outils de, de gestion de, de ce patrimoine vont vous êtes présentés par euh, la collectivité et le parc naturel de région, euh, régional de Martinique. Pardon. Bonjour. Hello. L'Observatoire martiniquais de la biodiversité est né de, de la volonté de plusieurs acteurs martiniquais d'améliorer les connaissances sur la biodiversité martiniquaise, mais également de, de, la, de la valoriser et surtout de, de la centraliser. Euh, diapo suivante, s'il vous plaît. 
Alors, cet observatoire du Martinique de la biodiversité a été installé en mai 2015 et concerne 41 structures institutionnelles et associatives qui ont signé une charte de fonctionnement qui définit donc les missions de cet observatoire, ses objectifs et son organisation. Donc, les missions principales de l'Observatoire sont donc, comme je l'ai dit précédemment, de centraliser et d'améliorer la diffusion de la connaissance sur la biodiversité, mais également d'améliorer le suivi de cette biodiversité, d'identifier les manques à l'amélioration des connaissances, de proposer des actions, d'identifier des menaces et des pressions qui s'exercent sur cette biodiversité, et ainsi d'accompagner les collectivités et les acteurs locaux, comme les associations, etc., à mieux, en, à mieux prendre en compte cette biodiversité dans leurs actions, et bien évidemment de valoriser, euh, d'améliorer la valorisation de, de cette biodiversité. Alors, ils ne sont pas concernés seulement les espèces patrimoniales et, et protégées, donc euh, cet observatoire euh, va, va concerner plusieurs champs, notamment la biodiversité euh, biologique, bien sûr, terrestres, aquatiques, marines, différents taxons, les espèces exotiques envahissantes, les espèces rares, les espèces communes, la géodiversité également, et euh, les interactions entre la société euh, et, et cette biodiversité. Les espèces domestiques sont également concernées. Pour euh, illustrer euh, quelques illustrations concrètes, euh, cet observatoire euh, permet donc euh, la réunion de 41 membres sous la forme de comités de pilotage, plusieurs comités de pilotage par an, des comités technologiques, qui vont se regrouper sur des activités diverses. Ensuite, plus concrètement encore, la mise en place d'un site Internet depuis environ trois ans qui permet de mieux diffuser les connaissances, le grand public également. Différents posters sur les colibris, sur les papillons, sur les mollusques terrestres à destination du grand public et des écoles. Également, bientôt, une mallette pédagogique qui sera donc diffusée au niveau des écoles et qui permettra justement de, de mieux valoriser les différents champs dont j'ai parlé précédemment, aussi bien le monde animal, le monde végétal, le milieu littoral, le milieu marin, les espèces exotiques envahissantes, etc. Je laisse donc la parole à Jessica Crillon, du Parc naturel marin. Hello, everybody. It's I'm so lucky to be able to work in this marine nature park with all of the wonderful team. Before uh, I say anything about it, all, what I want to say to you is go diving in the deep waters uh, around our island with the entire team. So our marine nature park was created in 2017. It was created because Martinique is very rich and under the sea there is a lot of damage that is caused there's a lot of pressure to the sea environment and what we want to do is reduce those pressures our nature park covers all of the waters around Martinique that's 48,000 square kilometers so it's a huge marine park so we have a team of four But the marine park really is a wonderful tea, a wonderful tool because we have a, a management committee, 51 people. We've got uh, uh, councillors, fishermen. We've got uh, 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 associations that uh, defend uh, nature. And if it's really because everyone wants to be uh, involved, we can see how quickly damage is incurred and we can't do anything on our own so we all have to work together there's a lot of discussion a lot of debate and sometimes it can be a bit tricky but uh, gradually we are managing to work on all of the different pressures to try and work towards reducing these different pressures so we've got a management uh, uh, plan and a strategy for 15 years so our management plan is very ambitious martinique has committed to several strong points zero pesticides for example zero waste And also, there's a lot of work being carried out on reducing pressure to enhance the situation. So in concrete terms, what do we do apart from our governance? Well, we've got a team. There are 22 people in the team. 
out on the field. We monitor situations. We work on different types of uh, problems, or even on traditional fishing and the impact it, the impact it can have on biodiversity. Because we have to perhaps reduce some of the traditional fishing. Uh, we have uh, a lot of work. Uh, we know that we're all linked and our sea is linked to the Sargasso Sea and we uh, also receive water from uh, Amazonia so all of the nutrients that come from uh, deforestation in uh, Amazonia we've talked about uh, deforestation and, and mining etc well we get those same currents and uh, we have uh, these build-ups and that kills a lot of our coral so we try also to work with the neighborhoods, with the citizens, to make them aware of how important biodiversity and nature are. So we get people, we've got a campaign currently running whereby people are encouraged to dive, to go down into the sea, to uh, see what treasures are down there. We uh, have a lot of uh, leisure sailors and we're trying to master how the anchors are dropped. We've got some scientific programs also to find out more about the seabed because the, the more we'll be able to monitor the seabed then the easier it will be to prove whether our initiatives are, pr are working or not and then we can make improvements. Earlier on we talked about that huge uh, problem with damage to coral. The hardest thing is to get people to change their behavior because it's the population that has to change its behavior and we have to take an interest in um, all kinds of species not only the uh, sea turtles but all all of them because we're all linked in a big uh, world of the living we're very we're in very complex uh, ecosystems so we don't understand everything so just to be cautious it's best for us to protect absolutely everything thank you for listening Bonjour à tous, nous étions donc avec Hello, euh, les collègues du Parc naturel de la Je vous proposais donc de basculer sur un autre uh, parc, le Parc naturel régional de la Martinique. Diapo, alors j'ai pas de. Oula, je n'ai pas. Je n'ai pas de retour. Diapo suivante. The regional nature park in Martinique, we cannot hear you, uh, the uh, bon connection is not very good. Vous entendez? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. On n'a pas le retour image, par contre. We don't have a, an image of the screen, sadly. We can't see what you're seeing. Alors oui, bonjour à tous. Alors, euh, Hello, désolé everybody. pour ces contingences euh, techniques, techniques, mais nous n'avons pas forcément de retour d'image sur vous. Uh, euh, si on pouvait mettre donc, la diapositive avec l'ensemble uh, du cheminement euh, sur donc, le, le parc naturel régional de la Martinique. Uh, je ne veux pas reprendre les éléments qui ont déjà été dits dans les éléments donc, uh, liminaires. De manière très ramassée, uh, le parc naturel régional de la Martinique, qu'est-ce que c'est C'est un des 56 parcs uh, régionaux donc, de la Fédération donc, des parcs. C'est l'un des plus vieux parcs, l'une plus vieille institution, uh, j'ai envie de dire, uh, politique. Hein, et instance donc martiniquaise, donc la création donc, du parc s'est faite en 1976. C'est à peu près donc effectivement donc les deux tiers du territoire de la Martinique, hein, à peu près donc aux alentours de 63 000 hectares. Et euh, c'est un territoire qui est effectivement euh, particulièrement riche du point de vue de la biodiversité. Euh, et pour ramasser un petit peu donc la présentation euh, sur les éléments qui ont déjà été précisés, c'est que la vocation du parc naturel de Genève en tant qu'outil et dispositif à la valorisation et la protection donc, du, euh, des, des patrimoines naturels et culturels et de la nature au sens le plus large que possible. C'est bien évidemment, euh, comme l'a précisé donc, le, le, le président Nadeau, assurer donc, cet équilibre entre les enjeux et les pressions anthropiques, les enjeux de conservation, d'amélioration des connaissances au niveau donc, de, 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 la, de la biodiversité locale, 
mais aussi intégrer une autre dimension, celle effectivement donc, de, du lien euh, 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 rapport euh, homme-nature. Et c'est bien pour ça qu'aujourd'hui, euh, les grands enjeux, les grands objectifs sont effectivement d'abord identifier donc, et la, les secteurs à valoriser, les secteurs à protéger, les secteurs également aussi donc, à, 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 à créer donc, les, les conditions d'aménité à la fois environnementales, économiques et touristiques qui permettent effectivement ce, donc, ce jeu d'équilibre. Euh, nous avons également des enjeux de conservation, notamment sur donc, euh, les, les, les réserves, parce que nous sommes en gestion donc, de trois réserves. La réserve donc, euh, donc, euh, de de la, de la Caravelle, donc en 1976, que, qui a été créée, celle donc, des îlets de Sainte-Anne euh, en, euh, en 1995, euh, la réserve à Le Farcus a été prise également donc, en 2000, 2014, et puis nous sommes en, en, en phase de finalisation, où il est, il est, le parc est, est pressenti pour être effectivement gestionnaire euh, de la future réserve territoriale, donc la baie de Chénie. Donc simplement pour vous dire qu'effectivement, le, le parc naturel régional, du fait de son territoire, du fait, de, du fait de, des missions qui lui sont conférées, et un acteur au centre, au, euh, je veux dire, donc dans la, la synergie des partenaires en, en place. Slide suivante sur notamment donc, les enjeux de conservation. Je ne reviendrai pas donc, sur les, tous les chiffres, ça a déjà été précisé. Donc, le parc abrite effectivement donc, 30 cas, contribue effectivement du, du fait de la présence de cette biodiversité, à la fois en termes terrestres, mais également aussi euh, euh, marines, dans euh, cette stratégie justement donc des enjeux visant à assurer la euh, protection et la valorisation, et j'ai envie de dire ces, ces enjeux donc, de protection et d'anticipation des, des, des pressions anthropiques. Je terminerai très, très rapidement sur la dernière slide, et ça a été précisé par M. le Président tout à l'heure. Effectivement, le parc naturel de Martinique a été identifié par l'UICN, des, des euh, les plus irremplaçables au monde du point de vue de la biodiversité, ce qui est l'un des fondements, et ça a été précisé, donc la candidature à la Martinique au patrimoine mondial. L'objectif pour nous, bien évidemment, en tant que maîtrise, sur cette candidature en relation avec les services de l'État, la collectivité territoriale, mais c'est l'ensemble des partenaires, c'est d'asseoir cette stratégie au, terme, au, au travers effectivement d'un euh, développement territorial, de marketing territorial, certes, mais aussi un projet de territoire qui vise à rassembler, à euh, aussi à asseoir effectivement une stratégie globale de gestion de l'ensemble du territoire martinique. Voilà ce qu'on pouvait dire très rapidement euh, sur les enjeux autour donc, de, 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 de l'UNTIC, hein, le parc naturel régional de la Martinique. C'est donc la parole à, à, à la collectivité territoriale euh, sur la finalisation donc, euh, des, des opérations en termes donc, de euh, valorisation donc, de la biodiversité locale. On, uh, local biodiversity. Donc, euh, bonjour. Pour illustrer une des trois réserves qui existent sur notre territoire, nous avons retenu la réserve naturelle marine du pêcheur, et nommée réserve marine Albert Falco. Cette zone située au nord-ouest de la Martinique, sur le domaine maritime de la commune du pêcheur, est reconnue pour sa richesse biologique. Donc, plus de 300 espèces marines inventoriées, dont certaines nécessitent une attention particulière car rares ou menacées. Cette zone est également reconnue pour la beauté de ses paysages sous-marins. Avec, par exemple, des canyons remarquables. Toutes ces caractéristiques ont justifié la création de la réserve à Ber Falco en 2014. Cette réserve d'un linéaire côtier de 12 km et d'une largeur de 600 mètres s'étend sur environ 600 hectares. Elle vise à allier la gestion concertée des usages telles que la pêche, la plongée, l'écotourisme, avec la préservation de cet espace marin d'un grand intérêt faunistique et floristique. La collectivité territoriale de Martinique a confié la gestion de cette réserve au parc naturel régional de la Martinique. Donc, votre opération confiée euh, au parc par la collectivité en partenariat avec euh, l'ADM, donc ça a déjà été largement abordé, c'est notre projet majeur de territoire, à savoir l'inscription sur la liste du patrimoine mondial de l'UNESCO, des volcans de, des forêts de la montagne Pelée et des pitons du Nord, monument naturel exceptionnel de la marque de cette la place à l'ADM. Donc effectivement, depuis bientôt dix ans, la collectivité territoriale de Martinique associée au service de l'État porte une candidature à l'inscription sur la liste du patrimoine mondial de l'UNESCO d'un bien naturel, ce bien, donc un bien en série qui repose sur deux massifs forestiers, sur les massifs volcaniques les plus récents, à savoir les boutons de la, de la Martinique et la montagne Pelée. Ce bien naturel est essentiellement public, on en a parlé tout à l'heure, il est constitué de massifs 
forestiers à 80% gérés par la collectivité et l'Office national des forêts. Il fait l'objet de protections fortes quasiment à 80%, donc il est porteur d'une valeur universelle exceptionnelle et dans un état d'intégrité euh, important. Euh, ces deux massifs forestiers euh, sont donc l'objet d'une candidature et euh, sur le périmètre que vous voyez en vert clair sur cette diapositive, donc, euh, nous avons défini une zone tampon qui permettra d'assurer l'intégrité du bien dans le temps et qui porte les engagements euh, sur la, la gestion de, de ces massifs forestiers. Diapositive cette euh, valeur universelle exceptionnelle euh, est euh, portée euh, par deux euh, critères. Euh, le premier critère qui est donc le critère de géologie euh, qui euh, euh, révèle un volcanisme très spécifique qui a contribué grandement à l'amélioration des connaissances scientifiques, notamment euh, le volcanisme péléen euh, qui euh, constitue une des lacunes du patrimoine mondial puisque depuis 1989, à l'occasion de trois études sur les volcans qui manquent à la liste du patrimoine mondial en 89, 99 et 2019. La montagne Pelée a été identifiée comme un des volcans qui manquait à la liste, à, la liste, à la fois pour euh, ce qu'elle a apporté à la science et, et euh, en raison de l'événement historique euh, qui a permis justement des, des, des découvertes importantes euh, en 1902 à l'occasion de, de l'éruption euh, du 8 mai 1902. Euh, le volcanisme euh, des pitons du nord de la Martinique qui est, exact, qui est également pardon, exceptionnel et unique en son genre. On, on, le, on le retrouve également sur l'île de Sainte-Lucie. Les pitons sont très dômes, extrêmement érigés. Euh, des dômes de lave d'une grande viscosité qui explique leur, euh, leur pente abrupte. Et euh, le, le secteur de... Euh, le développement de ces pitons a fait l'objet d'une très grosse déstabilisation de, de flanc qui est la plus grosse de l'arc des, des petites Antilles. Le deuxième critère euh, pour ce bien naturel est le critère dit de biodiversité, donc diapositive suivante. Now there is another uh, criteria I'd qui like to talk um, sur biodiversity uh, criteria. En fait, des habitats naturels uh, représentatifs les plus importants pour la conservation in situ de la biodiversité, uh, 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 de la diversité biologique. On l'a dit tout à l'heure, le bien uh, se situe dans les really régions prioritaires pour, uh, pour la conservation de la biodiversité. And, uh, le bien uh, se situe dans les 100 R les plus irremplaçables au monde. Et sur ce bien, on y trouve des continuités écologiques dans un état excellent état de conservation du littoral jusqu'au sommet, quasiment jusqu'à 1400 mètres, ce qui est unique dans l'arc des petites Antilles et permet justement euh, la, la préservation des, des différents types de milieux que l'on a évoqué au début, donc à savoir euh, des forêts sèches jusqu'aux forêts euh, humides et euh, aux forêts euh, d'altitude, et notamment les massifs aussi à Broméliacée, Fougétera. On y trouve so, également dans ces forêts euh, typiques des, des, des petites euh, Antilles une diversité botanique et des niveaux d'endémisme qui sont les plus élevés des petites Antilles really avec des espèces faunistiques et floristiques à forte valeur patrimoniale et irremplaçable donc qui ont notamment permis le placement du parc naturel régional dans les 100 airs les plus irremplaçables au monde. La gestion de ce bien qui est prévu, donc qui fait partie de la candidature, s'organise sur cinq axes à savoir, euh, dans un premier temps, des actions qui visent à la préservation stricte de la valeur universelle exceptionnelle dans le bien, euh, un axe sur le partage des connaissances de la biodiversité et de la géodiversité, et donc, donc l'amélioration et le partage de ces connaissances, notamment la mise en place de programmes scientifiques. L'axe 3 permet la mobilisation des valeurs culturelles au service de la candidature et de l'amélioration de l'histoire des hommes euh, Pardon, excusez-moi, parce qu'on me dit que... <rire> Il ne me reste pas beaucoup de temps. Donc, on l'appelle le critère culturel, donc euh, l'amélioration, euh, pardon, la mobilisation des valeurs culturelles au service de la candidature et donc l'appropriation par la population des, des valeurs euh, de ce bien. L'axe 4 constitue le projet de territoire, notamment toutes les actions qui peuvent avoir lieu dans la zone tampon au bénéfice de la préservation de l'intégrité du bien. Et l'axe 5 est un axe fort, un axe de coopération euh, régionale euh, et internationale avec les autres et national cooperation. Pour terminer, euh, donc cette candidature a débuté il y a bientôt dix euh, ans. Euh, uh, en 2014, uh, ago, 
le, le projet a été inscrit sur la liste indicative de la France euh, qui a mis en place des euh, niveaux de validation uh, nationale. Uh, en 2020, uh, nous avons validé uh, le, le dossier de candidature globale uh, qui a été déposé en, je, en janvier de cette année, en janvier 2021. Nous sommes désormais dans la phase d'évaluation de la candidature qui a débuté le mois d'avril. Uh, nous allons uh, avoir une évaluation de terrain et nous espérons donc un avis favorable au comité du patrimoine mondial en juillet 2022 à Committee will, voilà, je vous remercie. Um, will grant us, uh, these, uh, status je in July 2022. Uh, Thank you very much. Over to my uh, the speakers in Marseille. J'ai pas le retour image en plus. Thank you, dear speakers who are in Martinique. Thank you for presenting us all the challenges linked to biodiversity. Let's have a small, a short break before the next session. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are two minutes ahead of schedule. But as you know, time is precious. So without further ado, let's start this session. My name is Eric Pardieu. I am the General Secretary of the International Organization uh, of uh, Basins. And uh, we are delighted to welcome you here at the French Pavilion for this session about an initiative called 100 Projects about Water and Climate in Africa. I will talk more about it in a while. But first things first, let me introduce our distinguished speakers. Laurent Roy, the Director General of the Water Agency, Rhone Mediterranean and Corsica, the, so he is actually competent for the area around Marseille. Fozzi Brezzaville, the co-regional coordinator in the organization for the promotion of Senegal based in Dakar, and we are delighted to have him here. And uh, Marie-Laure, Marie-Laure Vercant, the Director General of the uh, French Partnership for Water, who will conclude our session in a little less than 30 minutes. What are we talking? What are we going to talking about? We we'll talk about this afternoon. It's an initiative started in 2017 called 100 Project about Water and Climate in Africa. Which is Africa because it is highly impacted by climate change. Some of you have already already see the effects of climate change on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, at least that's what uh, the media uh, says and shows. Uh, we see, we hear a lot about there are many wildfires, uh, water issues, many challenges in farming, and so on. Consequently, we need to act, we need to react, we need adaptation measures to fight climate change. So we needed to nurture new projects. We're talking about incubation, and uh, this is, uh, we hear a lot about it, uh, and uh, since the financial backers say that they don't have enough bankable projects to fund, See, that's not really uh, romantic, it's really practical, but that's how they say it. And um, there are many uh, people here, maybe in this Congress, who want to promote projects and who don't know how to uh, tackle uh, finance in the field of climate change. So they don't know how to uh, fulfill criteria in order to get funding. So that's 
when uh, one our project uh, uh, can get on the stage uh, because this project this uh, program can follow projects from their creation until to until they get funding so we are in the middle of the uh, process uh, framework and uh, today we will tell you about two uh, two cases two examples two success stories uh, uh, of this uh, initiative so that's what we're going to talk about this afternoon what we want to stress is that it is possible to uh, to build project for climate but it is really important to focus on the first steps of the project you got to uh, uh, keep moving forward without being discouraged and the first phases of projects are uh, crucial for the uh, success of a project and for a pro project to get funding i will stop here and i'll come back to this later if you have questions but without further ado i'll leave the floor to laurent roy the director of the uh, French water uh, agency. Uh, French water agencies are really active uh, uh, with this uh, program because there were uh, 100 projects that were accepted in five years, and French water agencies have uh, have agreed to uh, uh, help and provide guidance to uh, many of them. So, Laurent, uh, over to you. Thank you, Eric. And you're right, French water agencies are French are uh, public agencies. They are uh, run by uh, the government and they aim to provide a guidance about ensuring the good state of water. So we uh, collect uh, fees, uh, taxes, uh, according to the principle of the polluter pays. We support projects in France in order to reduce pollution projects who can help better ensure better distribution of water and projects that aim to restore the health of marine and natural environment uh, more generally legislation lets us allocate one percent of our annual budget to decentralized cooperation so we can support projects that are backed by local collectivities and we help them develop for example access to water or access to sanitation in the global south so to support these decentralized cooperation granted by the law we uh, have a, a institutional cooperation system where we collaborate with all uh, stakeholders, all relevant stakeholders, and together we find solutions to respond to current challenges, for example, adapting to climate change. So that was uh, a general overview of uh, uh, the, what we do. On the other hand, we know that uh, climate change, and I won't go deeper into details, everybody knows that climate change is happening. There are many people who didn't believe climate change was happening, but uh, you would go this summer, there were so many uh, disasters and catastrophes with uh, dramatic uh, consequences, tragic consequences. So uh, we are convinced that uh, climate change has the most dramatic effect, invisible effect on water because climate change uh, exacerbates the pressure exerted on water. And this leads to more frequent extreme weather events. There are longer droughts. They happen, they're more frequent. So there could be some dispute linked to what to use. Uh, but water is necessary for us to have drinkable water for us to for agriculture to produce electricity and to ensure uh, that uh, the, the ecosystems can uh, survive so resilience and ecosystems are also impacted by climate change so on 
one hand, uh, we've got water and global supply. On the other hand, there is climate change and uh, climate change with that impacts water with uh, tragic uh, consequences for local population. So that's the reason why water agencies had uh, to uh, partner with this uh, initiative, the 100 Project Water and Climate Afri Africa uh, Initiative. It was announced by President Macron in 2017. And then water agencies committed to uh, support 20 of the 100 uh, projects of the initiative. So we will be an, a so-called incubator. We will provide a guidance on the selected area. We will help uh, projects uh, be built, and then we will uh, help them uh, present their projects to uh, financial backers so that they can implement the project they conceived. So our role here is to help the selected territories to uh, build their project and to uh, respond to answer to the criteria set by international backers. So our target is a 20 project out of 100. There are 12 incubators, active incubators worldwide. They are being helped by water agencies. The um, 150,000 euros per incubator, but uh, my uh, colleague here, the, my guest speaker, will tell you more uh, through his project on the Senegal River. Um, I have uh, developed four incubators supported by the Water Agency for the Rhone Mediterranean and Corsica region. There's another project backed by another uh, water agency. This project is uh, based in Burkina Faso and aims at promoting local resources to support uh, family uh, farming. So this project also aims to combat desertification because the organic material that is collected will be used, uh, will be reused and will contribute to the Green Great Wall. And secondly, this project will help develop local livelihoods too. This project also aims to uh, gather 1 million years of funding with the uh, Climate Adaptation Fund, the African Development Bank. So this uh, is, uh, so, so we're really talking about an incubator and this uh, project obviously faces challenges because the security challenges in the Sahel region, but we uh, keep on uh, supporting it. We also support three other projects and uh, they are supported by my agency. First of all, there is a project in Mono River. This is a, a trans-border drainage area between Benin and Togo. The incubator is based in Benin and aims to vegetalize the drainage area to fight deforestation, preserve wetlands, support population resilience. And we will focus on different specific uh, species. Um, there are some added value uh, so-called species, uh, plants that could be medicinal uh, plants. And that is one of the uh, really interesting uh, points uh, here. The, each of these projects also have a social dimension. So we don't want projects to be imposed from the top. Everything starts with a local population and will benefit local populations. So we need to ensure locals get access to uh, resources, to uh, woodland resources. That's an efficient way to fight against deforestation. And the third project I wanted to mention is based in Madagascar, and uh, a conference just uh, 
uh, there was a conference this morning uh, uh, that was uh, organized, to, and they was the uh, director general of Madagascar for Water, and he uh, presented a project about a lake called Itash. This lake faces pollution issues with erosion problems. A, a great loss of lands that's a problem for farming and uh, the uh, pollution is also called by the uh, strong mining activities in the area and uh, there uh, consequently there are less and less farming activities and that's also due to climate change of course this third incubator aims to provide guidance to local farmers to develop a resilient agriculture with a level curves. We need to preserve soils. We will follow the indicators we have. We will develop uh, plantations for fruits, for example. This kind of plantation can offer an immediate added value to local population. So we will uh, tackle uh, water issues linked to the lake, uh, with uh, provide drinking water to the uh, population. But this project, this incubator and project also deals uh, with other issues. But this incubator, this is an incubator based in Madagascar. It is backed by an institutional cooperation, the institutional cooperation of different agencies and the uh, uh, Madagascar Authority. And this is uh, crucial for an integrated management of local resources. The fourth incubator is based in Morocco and is backed by another type of cooperation with twin cooperation between French agencies and agencies based in the global south. Our water agencies as a twin cooperation with an agency based in the south of Morocco. And this, uh, the latter, supports two incubators. And these two uh, incubators support uh, projects who want to renew uh, farming uh, practices at the local level and who aim to develop uh, tourism for the benefit of a population that is protecting uh, the local nature. So this project is about development, but it is based on the protection of environment on the protection of water uses. It is essential to grant access to local resources, namely water. In the uh, Région Sud, uh, we uh, will ask for uh, funding to different international uh, backers for a total amount of 5.5 million euros. So we uh, make efforts, we work to uh, get funding. So these, there's still work underway, uh, but it is quite an achievement because uh, we had to face the COVID pandemics and still we still uh, help support projects who uh, can uh, benefit the local population. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Thank you very much for giving us that uh, broad picture of what uh, you're doing. And it's great to hear that leverage effect of your um, project. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to Fauzi Benradin, because one of the projects that uh, he's going to describe is uh, particularly um, a particularly good example of that uh, lever effect. Fauzi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to this session that gives me an opportunity to talk about a project which is very important for us. As has already been said, this project was selected uh, to be one of the uh, 100 projects for water and climate in Africa. It came about thanks to a partnership between uh, different organisations including the International Water Office, with Eric, as Eric has already said, it uh, is the permanent secretary for
for uh, the, ba the Basin Organization. So this project is part and parcel of our Pact for Water, ensuring that uh, river basins and other aquatic features adapt to climate change. It corresponds to COP21. And it's also in line with the convention which we've had in place since uh, the year 2000, for example, focusing on integrated water resources. So within the framework of this project, which we call MOSES, it's a project which enables us to put in place a tool that uses satellite data that provides uh, instant information that can be used by uh, decision makers and it solves uh, a quite a big problem in uh, the water basin in Senegal. The project was developed because there was a really major need given the state of uh, the Senegal River. If you're familiar with that part of the world, you realize that it's a zone where there's a lot of irrigated agriculture. So we were facing the need, the urgent need, to uh, collect um, fees or taxes for water without which we can't continue to provide our service because we've got engineering uh, works that need to be maintained, we've got to uh, clear up, clean up the river, etc. We've got to be able to offer quality services uh, to everybody. So we really needed to gain information from uh, satellites and, and information from the ground. So the main objective is to have this operational tool uh, thank you. Thanks to modern technologies, uh, we can improve the level of money that is collected by the SOGED. So there are challenges, and there are two major challenges really. The main challenge is uh, the, the water and the food and water security which have to be implemented and one of the big uh, uh, components is rice it's a major factor in our economy is rice and uh, so uh, we have to concentrate on rice so talking with our partners and I would like to commend the commitment of uh, the uh, water agency, um, Rhone, Mediterranean and Corsica. And I would thank the, those who put our project in the uh, incubator. So, our project is uh, involving a tool that identifies irrigated farmland or agricultural land and it means that the farmers can, well it's not only not only to detect to where the uh, agricultural irrigation is taking place, it's a tool that enables partnerships so that we can uh, on the one hand identify the surface areas that are irrigated and in a second time to go and collect uh, taxes for that. So the two challenges which I mentioned earlier on were to be uh, efficient and also to ensure that all of the en all of the facilities are in good repair. So we're talking about the delta of the Senegal River. It's quite a unique zone. Eighty percent of irrigated surface or rather the delta contains 80% of irrigated services, uh, surfaces. So, we weren't collecting any tax for irrigation of rice. There are some big consumers that have huge parcels of land. And since we've started our policy, 
we know that some of the agricultural land has grown bigger. And so given all of the work that has been carried out, then the farmers are earning a lot of money. And so we were asked to put in place a tool that would uh, considerably help, help us to, con to collect considerably more taxes. So we've got a web service for our satellite information. And we can also assess how much land is dedicated to the growing of rice. We need to monitor those surface areas. So that was a useful tool. And we can monitor how uh, the uh, surfaces, surface areas are growing. And of course, we also want to enhance the capacity of our agents as they monitor the development of the rice growing lands. We have underlined an important piece of work which is the, the job out in the field. Of course, it's important to have satellite imagery, but it really is important also to be on the ground and to uh, back up and check this uh, satellite information and also to, to construct partnerships with the rice growers because without that partnership, then uh, the uh, tax collection is just not possible. I'm going to talk about the uh, processing chain, if you like. So the seasons come and go. The, the soil is impacted by the sun. Sometimes it can be burnt and then uh, it might be watered and that will make things a little bit better. I'm just going to say a couple of words about uh, the platform itself without being too technical. So we purchased satellite images from Sentinel-2 and so we identify where the vegetation is and then uh, we do what is necessary to validate the information that we glean from the satellite. We do fine tuning, if you like, and then we take a look at the results. So that means we can deploy our tool on WebGIS and uh, publish on WebGIS for our partners. And so we have already been able to do a lot of monitoring work to see how much land is watered every season. As you can imagine, the information that we get, because traditionally we just asked the farmers to provide that information, but now we've realised that there's a huge difference between what information the farmers were giving us and what the satellite is telling us. So we can compare the surface areas, and then we've got all kinds of uh, invoicing processes and I'm now going to talk about the future perspectives because this project is only the first step of a very big regional project that will enable us to, uh, to deploy this even further. So we have to get the tool um, certified. The invoicing service is already ready and then from Working only in the delta, we want to spread out to the, uh, to the whole river. So over time, things will be rolling out. We've got uh, OMVS to, is going to carry out certain uh, initiatives. And we too will uh, continue to partner different players with the water boards and other partners in the future to complete this project and have a tool which will enable us to preserve our water resources and to be more rational in how they're all used. Thank you for listening. Well, yes, that just goes to show how much te technology can help us. Now, I hope there are no urgent questions in the room because we've only got five minutes left. But for these last five minutes, I'm going to hand the floor over to Marie-Laure Vercon, who is going to wrap up our session. And she is, of course, going to ex respect the time window, which has been allotted to us. Thank you very much. But you can ask uh, questions uh, after the actual uh, presentation. We will hang around. But I'm just going to present a conclusion now. 
So we have presented to you this initiative that the French Partnership for Water ha is supporting. We are work working with the I EIO and uh, different uh, partnerships. We're working with a platform with 200 members, 200 players in the world of water provision. We've got water boards, the OIO, we've got public uh, administrations, uh, uh, ministries, we've got uh, the NRC and NRS. So there are many partners involved. And so we are part of this initiative because we support a uh, sludge spreading project in Senegal. We'll be presenting our results in Dakar at the uh, Water Forum. So you've heard about different projects, so replanting vegetation in Benin, resilient agriculture, and all of these projects have got high added value. You've also heard talk about the twinning program in uh, Morocco with the French um, water board and the Moroccan ones. We are also doing uh, ecotourism projects as well. And we're also, we've also heard about the work in Senegal to uh, promote the Senegal River there. So presenting this initiative is a way of reminding you of how important water is in the context of climate change and adapting to that because many partners, of, uh, in the, some of them whom are present in this room, took part in Climate is Water, a program which we launched. We're going to remind, rem remind everyone of this in Glasgow. In Glasgow, we're going to present this initiative again, and it needs funding. All of these projects that have been presented to you, well, some have already been funded, others are in an incubator stage, and they're waiting for funding. We need to fund them. These are absolutely emblematic projects with high added value. So I would invite you all to come to the session uh, that you can read about on, on the net that we're going to be holding in Glasgow. Let me just tell you in the meantime how important water is and how important it is to uh, adapt. During this Congress, at the IUCN Congress, 90% of aquatic populations have disappeared in 50 years and 84% of wetlands have been dried. So I want you to draw that uh, conclusion for yourself between adaptation, water and climate. Thank you for listening. Mr. Ministers, Madam Minister, ladies and gentlemen, this event is a joint initiative undertaken by the Minister for Foreign Affairs of France and Gabon, Jean-Yves Le Drian and Paco Mobile Boubea, for the uh, Alliance of Preservation of uh, Tropical Rainfall Forest. France has initiated this alliance during the G7 that took place in Biarritz and was launched officially at the United Nations in 2019. This initiative is a high-level uh, platform with forest and non-forest uh, countries focused on uh, different uh, uh, tropical basins in, on different continents. Three years after it was launched in Biarritz, this alliance has a charter signed by 31st member countries, among which Gabon, Congo, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, and Morocco. Gabon is here represented by Mr. Guy White, is online. He has officially backed the alliance during the COP25 in Madrid in 2019. As, uh, as the charter reminds us, we need to uh, put an end to the destruction, the destruction of nature to uh, reach the target of the Paris Agreement to uh, work for the post-2020 uh, International Agreement on Biodiversity. 
This alliance more specifically aims to implement sustainable value chains uh, and to fight against different extreme weather uh, events and the degradation of forest. The national strategy to uh, fight against deforestation implemented by France calls for the commitment of businesses and public institutions. This gives us the opportunity to gather uh, private uh, sector uh, partners and to uh, showcase the relevance of a French and African cooperation in this field. This session will aim to lay the foundation of the operationalization of the alliance by creating a business forum in order to implement sustainable value chains in Africa. Over to Mr. Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian. Mr. Minister, dear Pakom, dear Minister of Forest, Mr. Lee White, Madam Minister Berenger Abba, dear friends, Tropical forest basins are part of humanity, humankind's common good. It is a sovereign area for states on which they're based. They are also part of the natural heritage, and it is our responsibility to protect them because they are the lungs of our planet. So that's why we work with our allies to fight against climate change. There are reservoirs for biodiversity. Many communities work in these areas. That's the reason why France, supported by Gabon, has launched this alliance during the Biarritz summit in 2017, while the rainforest was burning. There are 31 member states in our alliance, and they are they follow a charter who aims to preserve, to fight against factors of deforestation and other factors that of degradation of the forest. Our forests play a crucial role in our ecosystem. There have been many wildfires this week, so we need common efforts to preserve them. I am uh, delighted to say that, dear Pakom, we have a very dynamic partnership with Gabon. We started it early in the field of land planning, forest land, woodlands planning. And this cooperation is crucial for the future, as well as for the multilateral dimension of the environmental issue. France has uh, granted 100 million euros to this cooperation, as well as many other fundings uh, for projects uh, about wood, about uh, protection of the environment, about the protection of flora and fauna. Or, um, and we have been working together for a long time, and uh, we have this common will to work together, especially uh, in Central Africa, where we are launching two projects to promote sustainable development projects in uh, the forest. We have uh, implemented, we have materialized our commitment uh, within the charter has become a reality and we have encouraged the implementation of sustainable value chain in Africa, low carbon value chain. This was our target and we wanted to, that's the uh, target we want to promote today during this session because together we have taken the decision to uh, to uh, promote a, a national strategy in France. And we have promoted a purchasing guide, a zero waste purchasing guide. We will uh, talk about it during the next semester when France holds the presidency of the Council of the Un European Union. As you know, the European Commission should put forward proposals very soon. 
beyond that, we wanted to organize a business forum that will lead the way for an enhanced dialogue between entrepreneurs and businesses ahead of the next COP, whether it is the COP26 or the next. This business forum will be the result of our commitment to uh, uh, acknowledge our forest and in Nice there will be another business forum in Nice and this event will serve as a tool to generate a, a solutions to be a source of solutions consistent and responsible solutions to preserve for the forest that is why I wanted today to emphasize to promote the common uh, partnership we have with Gabon, we together we have launched a momentum and a process to find common solution. Thank you for your attention. I'll leave the floor to you. Mr. Minister of uh, Europe and Foreign Affairs in France, my brother Jean-Yves, Mr. Minister Lee White, who follows our session from where he is in the Netherlands, Madam Minister, Madam Ambassador of Gabon, Mr. Chief Negotiator Andy Gauma from Gabon, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me remind you that one month ago, the IPCC the, has published its sixth report that stated that if we don't act now, if you don't take strong measures to reduce our greenhouse gases emissions within the next by within the next 15 years we will reach uh, in the point of non return and we want to uh, contribute to this uh, global fight in accordance with the strategic vision of the president of Gabon as you know the Congo Basin forests and bogs have stored global CO2 emissions for 10 years. We cannot, uh, we won't be able to limit the temperate, global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees if the Congo Basin doesn't remain untouched, isn't protected. The Congo Basin forest fuel the Sahel and the mountains. They provide rain to these regions. They, it has a endemic, ecosystemic, it renders ecosystemic services and preserves the uh, social, uh, social peace. G the Republic of Gabon has many forests. There is a low uh, rate of deforestations, and uh, uh, there is a unique uh, biodiversity there. That's why we want, alongside uh, France, with Jean-Yves Le Drian here, we have uh, committed themselves. We have to backing the Alliance for the Preservation of Tropical Rainforest. For decades, Gabon has implemented virtuous policies to ensure the sustainable management of forest. It is now essential to go further and exploit the forest but uh, to promote it so we can absorb each year 100 million tons of co2 we can preserve the forest but and exploit them to the benefit of local population 
while ensuring a balance and preserving biodiversity. And now I call on uh, businesses, especially uh, wood uh, processing uh, companies, I call on them to contribute to the sustainable management of our forest. In order to do that, they should improve the technique to preserve this a resource that is indispensable for the well-being of our planet. If we don't implement an integrated model with sustainable value chains, our forest will face a vicious circle of deforestation. This business forum is our response to this challenge, this development challenge, as Jean-Yves uh, put it uh, earlier. Moreover, Gabon and France have uh, pledged in, uh, uh, in the wake ahead of the forum that will take place uh, in Nice. So we will call on private actors to uh, use uh, existing mechanism and to create a business forum in for uh, the for sustainable value chains in Africa so we can uh, so we can create jobs in Africa to conclude I will call on our businesses no matter where they are in the world to unite to join forces and create a dynamic, solid forest economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, ministers, for those words and those announcements. We're now going to hand the floor to Professor Lee Wright, uh, Minister of uh, the Forests, who's speaking from Germany. Sadly, we cannot hear you yet. Could you try to hear me now? Can you hear me now? Donc, uh, bonsoir, Good evening. Mesdames uh, et Messieurs Ladies le Ministre. And gentlemen, on, Ministers. On voit bien que we le Ministre Pacom that Minister Paco uh, is an ancient Minister of the Eaux et Forêts. Il a bien présenté the la situation. Il a pas de, well. on ne peut pas gagner la guerre contre we les changements climatiques sans une bassine de Congo intacte. Uh, le Gabon, à 88% forêt, doit absolument maintenir son couverture de forêt, maintenir cette absorption nette de CO2 euh, et nous sommes convaincus que c'est à travers une exploitation forestière durable, responsable, euh, à travers un partenariat euh, entre le public et le secteur privé qu'on qu va pouvoir faire cela. Aujourd'hui, 100% de notre bois est, est transformé au Gabon, mais pour l'instant, la plupart transformé uh, au, au, au premier niveau de transformation. Et dans level. nos analyses économiques, on est, on est convaincu que si le Gabon n'a pas sure un modèle économique, un business plan pour préserver nos propres forêts, euh, inévitablement, nos forêts vont suivre le, le même trajet que les forêts un peu partout dans le monde. On est convaincu qu'en passant à la deuxième, à la troisième transformation, en exploitant rationnellement notre forêt, en, 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 en amenant un, un supplément de bois dans les plantations, on peut multiplier fois 20 notre économie forestière. On peut petit à petit remplacer le pétrole qui est destiné à disparaître de notre économie à cause des changements climatiques avec des produits bois. On sait que nos produits bois doivent être légaux. 
peuvent être exploités durablement, doivent être positifs pour le climat, doivent être positifs pour la biodiversité et doivent être exploités d'une façon respectueux de nos populations. Et si on peut faire ça avec des sociétés forestières privées, des sociétés de transmission de bois, on peut préserver la forêt en exploitant la forêt. Si nos bois sont certifiés, si if wood mon ministère fait son labeled, travail if my ministry does its job, pour garantir que le bois est légal et durable, euh, on peut maintenir cette, euh, cette uh, fonction d'absorption de, de CO2. CO2 euh, on peut rester pas seulement carbone neutre, mais carbone positif. C'est vraiment ça la le, 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 le vision uh, aujourd'hui really du ministère, du gouvernement uh, 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 du Gabon. Donc, main dans la main, Gabon, so avec le secteur hand, privé, uh, uh, il faut qu'on travaille pour préserver les forêts du bassin de l'Ogwe. Et peut-être à travers ce modèle, on peut inspirer également uh, les autres pays du bassin du Congo uh, de préserver cette forêt qui est critique pour l'homme. Donc, merci pour votre intérêt. Cette initiative est très importante et on, on est, comme on dit au Gabon, on est ensemble. Merci beaucoup et bonne soirée. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for those words and for being so encouraging and for your commitment. I would like to uh, remind everyone how involved you were in the creation of this allegiance, this alliance that we're all now in. So, ministers here in uh, Marseille, you've uh, encouraged the private sector to respond to your call. We are going to ha hear from the private sector now, get some comments, I'm sure from the general manager of the International Technical Society of Exotic Woods, Benoit Duval, who is, uh, is with us today. Hello, everybody. Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs, Mr. Minister of Foreign Affairs of Gabon, Madam Minister, Minister in charge of the forests uh, in Gabon by video conference. First of all, I would like to thank you all very sincerely for the opportunity we have today to participate in the launch of this forum that we are embracing optimistically because it is going to help diversify economies in Central Africa and to reinforce sustainable wood industry to uh, protect uh, exotic and rainforests, as we've already heard in order to reach the objectives uh, noted uh, in the Paris Agreement. The Tropical Wood Association is your partner in the private sector because our association tri strives to diversify the uh, market for certified exotic woods, mainly coming from Central Africa. The members of the association produce in Africa, they produce 10 million hectares of certified forests and produce 3 million cubic meters of wood. Certain points uh, are going to be repeated here. Apologies just for that. Gabon is one of the most innovative and inspirational countries for our sector and for our association and we have always been there as the uh, Gabonese wood industry has developed our member companies can be considered as models 
if you look back at what's been done over the last two decades in terms of um, town planning, sustainable planning, organizing forest plots in a sustainable manner, and in setting up a system for checking the legality of the wood, particularly in uh, the busiest zones, which is part and parcel of uh, Gabon's uh, policy to develop its wood industry. As far as processing is concerned, we were there in 2010 um, when measures were adopted by CMAC, measures that we now have to help even further to make them sustainable, both for states and for businesses. Some uh, forest businesses in Gabon have been committed to legality, certification, traceability of wood. We have to trust them because for many years they really have been major players in the whole development. Because of uh, the decision now to head towards an integrated label system for the industry, a huge step has been taken. We will be, continue to be with your sides as things evolve. We now have to better promote these efforts and get the intrinsic value better recognized and also the environmental value recognized of tropical woods that will enable us to uh, maintain these sustainable forests alive because they're so rich in terms of biodiversity on a broader scale and let me remind you the sustainable wood industry is a model uh, against deforestation. It is the only industry insofar as it is, in, is, la is labelled to guarantee perfect traceability from forest to final consumer and to heighten awareness and to enhance the living condi conditions of those people whose livelihoods are dependent upon the forest. So we are, uh, can be a big, a big sister to other industries such as cacao, or palm oil, uh, soya and others. It's, it cannot be stressed enough that certified wood products are a solution in the fight against deforestation because of the value they give to uh, exotic uh, forests, because of the excellent qualities they have and because of the um, carbon stock storage that is guaranteed. This new business forum will also make it possible to make progress in, in other areas because this business forum is so important, it has to reach its uh, objectives and we have many ideas to ensure that everything works. As far as the European Union wood regulations are concerned, we need better certification recognition to ensure to encourage the trade of certified legal wood as far as communication about uh, sustainable management uh, uh, labels are concerned we need to uh, point out how important they are to combat the de degradation of forests as far as public procurement is concerned with a French charter which is very encouraging we need to remove certain um, hurdles such as the uh, Olympic Games 2024, an organization which is boycotting uh, exotic woods at a time when the markets have to take into account those efforts being made by the producing countries. Still talking about markets, we have to relentlessly continue to diversify the types of trees that are being used as far as payment for environmental services. We have to make it easier to set them up if business models are to survive. And on this subject, in concrete terms, I'm going to uh, echo Lee White's words, hand in hand is the way that we will solve these very complex issues. So as far as players from Asia are concerned, although Europe buys uh, processed wood and uh, the, China, the, the Asiatics are working three quarters of the Gabon's forest, we now all have to sit around the table and we have to make this sustainable value chain operational by being very pragmatic. Obviously, 
This final point is key. Combating illegal wood must be an ongoing process, and we have to put up the necessary resources. Illegal wood undermines the image of the legal wood providers, and it also constitutes unfair competition. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for those details and those thoughts that you have uh, brought to us. We have a few minutes remaining, in fact, very, very few minutes. We've got six minutes remaining. In the room, are there any questions? I can see some hands being raised. We do have a microphone, so kindly wait for the microphone before you voice your question. Hello. A question for Mr. Lee White, if he's still with us. I come from the organization called Canopy. My question is for the Minister of Foreign Affairs from the Gabon. And I've got two questions. The first question, Gabon had banned the use of a, a very major tree in 2011 and started using that tree again, as you know. We can manufacture the Nuabi oil, uh, which is used in cosmetics. In economic terms, I've heard that it's more advantageous, economically speaking. I was in a session yesterday, and there, we heard that there were French businesses that were interested in importing the Nuabi uh, oil to, for their cosmetics. Today, we need a paper. It's part of the Nagoya uh, Convention in the law we have to be able to export uh, Nuwabi oil. So that's a question for you. Is Gabon going to commit to uh, exporting this oil? There are some businesses that really want to buy it. And the second question is about cacao. NGOs have examined the recovery plan for the Gabon cacao industry and we're rather worried because there is no mention of the word combating deforestation. However, we have seen the word extending the uh, cacao forests. We want to make sure that uh, one can uh, renovate the old cacao tree forests, but we want to make sure that Gabon is not going to contribute to deforestation. Thank you very much. We don't have a lot of time. Is there another question in the room before we go to the answers? Yes, hello. I'm in charge of Max Avila, and my question is a similar. Are there other industries such as exotic woods that are part of this business forum? Uh, for information, there are dozens of businesses and uh, small businesses here in France that are in uh, the uh, fair trade. 10% of uh, exotic wood is guaranteeing a fair, fair remuneration and no child labour. So it would be wonderful if this business forum would also carry uh, emerging subsidiaries or uh, emerging uh, industries of uh, banana, cacao in France. Mr. Minister, would you care to answer? Thank you very much for these two questions. Minister Lee White had to leave, sadly, he had another appointment. So let me allow with you uh, the general point of view in Gabon. The Nuabi oil, which you're talking about, well, we call it Muyabi. It's a wood that has a long history to it. It's at the heart of all of our communities even communities such as mine, because I come from the forests, the uh, tropical forests in south of Gabon, and Moabi uh, produces uh, fruits, which we use to extract the oil. We call it the Muyobi oil. And we mainly use uh, the oil uh, for cooking, because we extract the oil from the fruit of the tree. And we have lots of recipes, delicious recipes, that use the oil. And this oil is also used uh, in our pharmacopoeia because you can mix this oil with other plant elements to uh, 
cater for skin complaints or other health problems. So what I'm trying to say is that we have ancestral knowledge about growing and producing this oil. It's important to know that it is not an oil that can be produced at a large scale, hundreds of thousands of liters. We produce tiny uh, quantities, they're a bit like essential oils, if you like. And I think that is a fabulous advantage that we have because for a very long time, we forbade the production of Moabi. It's not as green a solution as you're suggesting because it really does uh, preoccupy the, the local populations and we are still open to talk about it about the possibility of uh, developing the production of these essences uh, to the good of mankind, because of course it could be uh, positive. The second point you mentioned was a cacao point. Uh, let's take a look at the history of Gabon and see that uh, in the past, uh, when we were producing oil, uh, Gabon produced a lot of cacao, but now, sadly or happily, whichever way you look at it, uh, from the, uh, the 60s and the 70s, there was a huge decrease in uh, the production of cacao. And today it's increasing again because, it, because we're only using those spaces which were already existing, those areas already existing. And the plan that the minister in charge of agriculture put in place it's, it's not going to. It's not going to lead to any deforestation, as you know, because we work a lot with your uh, NGO, Canopy. Gabon is not a country where we remove the forest in the in the way that the West understands that, where we cut down trees and leave the land bare. Uh, in Gabon, we work with the forest. We work with the land. We have all kinds of laws and regulations. Um, which ensure that we conserve all of the ecosystem values in our forests. So we are sustainable in our approach. Thank you. Yes, and to get back to the second question, uh, yes, I think it would be a good question to broaden uh, the business forum to all uh, uh, sectors which contribute to biodiversity because it's a question of dreaming up a methodology. We're talking about exchanges here. There was a contribution to that just a second ago. A method for creating a label, identification, partnerships covering all industries that will be able to help with biodiversity, including uh, cacao, uh, palm oil, and different woods and uh, derivatives. So I'm very positive to that notion. If we can implement it, it would be a good idea because this is a methodology which we have decided upon. It's going to be very original, and I think it will be very fruitful as, as we work together with Gabon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ministers. Unfortunately, how our time's up. I uh, leave the conclusion to the Secretary of State responsible for ecological transition, Berenger Abba. Thank you, Mr. Ministers, um, Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me to conclude this session, as Mr. Le Drian just mentioned. And we see that there is a momentum around the tropical rainforest being built. And we see today that this world, this natural heritage, is a hope for tomorrow. Our uh, forest uh, is decreasing, and from 2018, the loss of forest mainly it was mainly in the uh, tropical rainforest. 
However, these uh, rainforests uh, account for 80% of worldwide biodiversity. I don't think I need to uh, explain why we need to protect it. We uh, need to lead by example and take uh, ambitious and transparent uh, measures. We need to decide to make decisions to change the way we live, our the way we consume. Uh, and France has been implemented uh, has been implementing a national strategy against deforestation for a few years with really strong measures that were translated in the law. We have a new platform of information, a new a warning mechanism for importers, and we use uh, different data to shed a light on uh, products that are, have uh, have caused deforestation and we will also launch a plan to limit the import of uh, crops who cause deforestation. We have a zero deforestation uh, policy. 10% of the uh, GDP uh, is allocated to uh, these uh, uh, measures to, this, uh, for this, uh, to reach these targets because we want to stop uh, buying uh, products uh, that cause deforestation very soon. And as it was said earlier, we need to reinforce the ad allocated to efforts uh, that aim to, uh, to promote sustainable development. We need to cut these uh, harmful imports and work together with the private sector, the public sector, with the uh, scientists, and this uh, alliance can now act on a wider scale and you can act together to reduce the pressure on ecosystems. There are different uh, guidelines in this alliance. The French Agency for Biodiversity uh, uh, will actually help and contribute to uh, funding measures against deforestation. So this uh, will be uh, in, uh, an exemplary, uh, a, an example of cooperation. So we have a, also a strategy to ensure a cooperation between different countries with incentives for raw materials and more sustainable value chain. And I do think this forum is essential to foster, uh, foster greater cooperation with our partners. So congratulations for this islands alliance who is at the heart of the international political agenda. And that's a great achievement. And as you can see, uh, there is applause around us. There are many different uh, branches, many different sectors that uh, are involved. We mentioned wood, but we uh, want to extend our actions to other uh, sectors, uh, for example, to soya. And very soon, we uh, plan to work in the sector of caca cocoa. We are really uh, excited to uh, find out what we will do in different sectors. So you rest assured that we are committed to uh, this, uh, to this uh, alliance, to this uh, goal. And while the France holds the presidency of the Council of the European Union, this uh, goal will remain a priority. Thanks again for being here, for showing interest, and for showing uh, your commitment to our fight against these uh, harmful imports. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. I'm delighted to see so many of you, although uh, although it, it, it can be quite difficult, quite uncomfortable to be here because of the uh, new uh, restriction measures. So Mr. Uh, directors, Madam Ministers, Mr. Ministers, dear friends, uh, today we want to take stock of an old project, the uh, Great Great Wall. This project has evolved. There have been developments because the accelerator of the Great Green Wall was launched during the One Planet Summit. That took place in last January in Paris. 
This session will be organized, it will be divided in three sections. First of all, we will talk about the uh, political commitments that were made at the national and international level. Secondly, we will talk about the commitment of the uh, civil society actors who uh, are really active in these initiatives. Uh, we will also talk about the scientific community because in the end, we need them to assess the project. Finally, we will talk and hear our financing uh, partners, our financing uh, backers, and we are looking forward to hearing them ever since the announcement was made in Paris. Without further ado, I uh, leave the floor to the Minister of the Environment of Mauritania, the current president of the Pan-African Agency of the Great Great Wall. Madam Minister, please. Excellencies, Mr. Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs, Mr. Executive uh, the Secretary of the Convention to Combat uh, Desertification, and Mr. High Commissioner for the 3N Initiatives, Ms. Ladies and Gentlemen, Representatives of Financing Partners, Ms. Ladies and Gentlemen, Representatives of Civil Society, Ladies and Gentlemen, as the President of uh, the uh, Council of Ministers of Environment of the Great Green Wall, I would like to thank Mr. Jean-Louis Le Drian, the Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs, as well as Mr. Ibrahim the executive secretary of the convention against it to, to combat desertification for their uh, efforts and for organizing this event. There have been exchanges about the accelerator of the Great Green Wall today at this Congress, and this shows that we do understand the, that uh, the end-to-twin challenges as the basis of the Great Green Wall. We need to restore lands to uh, fight ch climate change, to preserve biodiversity, to reduce pollution, and to reinforce uh, uh, food security and the uh, uh, livelihoods of com communities. Let me remind you that this project, the Great Green Wall Project, is in line with the principle and the objectives of the Agenda 2030 and of the Paris Agreement. It aims to uh, contribute to the uh, sustainable development of rural areas in the Sahel region by uh, through a uh, multi-sectorial and inclusive approach. This program aims to restore 100 million hectares of degraded lands and to create uh, many uh, green jobs by 2030. During the uh, meeting of the Ministers of Environment of the Great Green Wall, who, which took place in last July, member states have uh, recognized that we need to intensify the uh, measures taken for the Great Green Wall to, uh, for the economic recovery and improve the lives of rural communities. They also stress the obstacles that have limited investments until now. They also stress that there's a lack of investment and limited technical capacities in local, national, uh, and international structures. The uh, Council of Ministers of Great Green Wall has adopted an investment plan on 10 years between 2021 and 2030. It is an ambitious plan, but it uh, is comparable to the challenges ahead as the uh, climate crisis is accelerating and the pandemics is still here. And we have seen uh, synergies between this investment plan and the different levers of the accelerator of the Great Green Wall. However, we do uh, we still do not know how we we will ensure access to announced uh, funding. We uh, want uh, we want to ensure it is done, and we also want to simplify the access criteria to funding with reasonable deadlines. Those are the last recommendations put forward by the Council of Ministers. And we were asked, the Great Green Wall was asked to organize 
along the UN Convention Against Desertification, a, a virtual dialogue, high-level dialogue between state member states and financial and technical partners to improve our financing approaches and to adjust them with the uh, member states' expectations. So that's what uh, we want to do uh, today. It is uh, crucial that our financial mechanisms are based around national prior priorities. We just call on international organizations who have accepted to coordinate their action around the Great Green Wall to work in partnership, in close partnership with the Pan African Agency of the Great Green Wall and national organizations. Indeed, we want to uh, define the best funding modalities we can have and to adjust them to local needs. The actors of the Great Green Wall are established in the majority of uh, member states. They have to uh, steer projects in close collaboration with relevant uh, sectors and local actors uh, above all collectivities, businesses, and civil society organizations. To conclude, let me stress that this dialogue which gathers political actors, financial institutions, and civil society is uh, crucial for the uh, Sahel countries who still have uh, uh, debt uh, that in this very difficult context. And we uh, want to uh, uh, funding that will take the uh, specific vulnerabil vulnerabilities of uh, member states. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Madam Minister. I turn towards uh, the Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs. I leave the floor over to you. Madam Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Mauritania, dear Mariam. Mr. Executive Secretary, Mr. High Commissioner, dear friends, the Great Green Wall Initiative is, to me, key for the future of the Sahel region and so for the future that the African continent and friends will invent together. This is crucial. It is a resurrection, a rebirth, a rebirth that is crucial for the future. This uh, initiative will create uh, tens of thousands of jobs in the region and will provide a concrete res response to our uh, climate challenges. It is therefore a crucial uh, topic. And uh, today uh, we are here and we are here to talk about its implementation. It is an urgent uh, matter. Indeed, we know that the pandemics has aggravated the uh, food uh, food crisis, has exacerbated and aggravated the local vulnerabilities in the region as well as elsewhere, and in the region where France as well as uh, its uh, European partners are still uh, helping fight terrorists. So this initiative is a, uh, a source of hope for the Sahel, and we hope that our common responsibility will become a reality very soon. And today I would like to express that uh, my uh, will to act along with you, the One Planet Summit uh, relaunched the Great Green Wall because we uh, started the Great Accelerator that already has mobilized 16 billion euros. And now uh, we, s we must make a difference on the ground and rest assured that President Macron uh, closely follows uh, progress, progress on this matter. Madam uh, Minister, you can count on France for doing its part in this collective effort and in close collaboration with the Secretariat of the Convention to Combat Desertification and the Pan-African Agency of the Great Green Wall, we give our political 
technical and financial support to this initiative. And that's why France has decided to fund a project that is in line with this patchworks of rural development project, a project called the Nexus Emergency Development Peace, and it will be launched soon in Niger. Mr. High Commissioner, dear Ali Betty, I am delighted to say that this project is also in line with your program, the Nigerians Feed People from Niger, and you will talk about it later. France will also uh, be at the uh, next uh, Food System Summit, the France Africa Summit, and uh, another summit as they will happen under our presidency of the Council of the Union, of the European Union, and we will use this opportunity to reinforce international mobilization for agroecology in the Sahel. As I said, the One Planet Summit in January has gathered six billion euros. The uh, the Pan-African uh, Agency for the Great Green Wall had uh, called for $10 billion in the next five years and uh, $32 billion by 2030. So we need to uh, act and to move forward. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am here to uh, send you a message, a message that to convey a message, we have you have support, a high level of support, and I am here to hear the recommendations put forward by all the actors who act, who want uh, the Green Great Wall that is our state partners, backers, the representative of the civil society and the research community. We can act together and together we can succeed. And this initiative is a great way to uh, create synergies between the different partners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you for being here. I uh, know that this project is really important to you. And thank you very much. And now I leave the floor to the Executive Secretary of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, Ibrahim Sio. He will talk about the accelerator of this great green wall. Mr. Minister, Madam Minister, Mi Mr. Commissioner, the great green wall. In January, at the One Planet Summit, the world has found a new momentum and the countries of the Sahel region have have welcomed this new momentum thanks to the leadership of the relevant African countries and of uh, France and its president, President Macron. Six, $16 billion, that's a huge amount of money, but it is not sufficient uh, to uh, to for the uh, priority uh, investment plan validated by ministers in the Sahel. That's a good starting point, though. Six billion dollars for 11 countries on a period of five years from 2021 until 2025. We have identified needs for Sahel. And the Sahel needs uh, uh, need a few for 24 billion uh, billion dollars a year. We need to restore 8.2 billion hectares per year uh, by 2030. If we want to reach our final goal, this is an environmental project, but not only. And Mr. Minister uh, does understand that. Mrs. Uh, President of the Council of Ministers has uh, mentioned it along with her uh, colleagues uh, here. The Great We Wall, contrary to what its name uh, says, isn't only about reforestation. Five countries have been identified by the accelerator. 
We aim to create SMEs in the Sahel region in order to promote jobs, to promote rural economy. We want to restore lands, of course, since this region is a desert, it's really dry. We need renewable energies for the for light but also for development to transform agriculture to reduce agricultural losses and to create jobs in the agricultural sector we need an effective governance to manage everything and the fifth pillar is the uh, reinforcing our capacities we are delighted to see that up to 48 percent of the funding that were announced in january of already been uh, earmarked for the uh, period for the 2020 20, 25 periods they were earmarked but not spent and i'll be really happy when i see them being transferred to local communities that is to uh, populate to locals those who are responsible for the implementation i'll be happy to see young girls and young uh, boys doing better in the region I would like to thank all the institutions who have backed us, who have announced their support, the African ba Development Bank, the European Development Bank, the World Bank, the European Commission, the French Industry for Development, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, the Green Fund, and the FAO. And those are the uh, international organization who we back us financially uh, during the first phase. We hope there will be many more funding and most of them, we know there is a lot of potential in the private sector. Mr. Minister, you mentioned COP26 that will take place in a few weeks. There will also be the biodiversity uh, COP. Uh, in next April, but there will also be a conference of the parties about desertification that will take place in May 2022. And we would, uh, would like these events to uh, be opportunities to take stock of the situation uh, along with the international community, the representative of the civil society, and with all the other partners. These events can be an, an opportunity to take stock of our challenges and our opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tu. Now I would like to invite Ali Betty to step forward to talk about the 3N initiative because they haven't been waiting for the uh, Great Green Wall project to take off to uh, inspire the rest of us. ministers from Europe and uh, the foreign affairs. Madam Bekay from Mauritania, presidency of the Pan-African Agency of the Great Green Wall. Ibrahim uh, Theo, United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, the food crisis of the 70s and the 80s really did mark Niger. And leaders now, are haunted by it and they are worried about how we can anticipate crises, food crises which degenerate and create huge socioeconomic problems. So there is a search for political tools to uh, anticipate these crises. Hence the start at the beginning of the 90s at the initiative of the government, a process for setting up progressively a structured measure to manage food crises. This, uh, this, this measure is uh, focused on early warning, responses to crises, and social institutions. So the, conjunct the structural Fragility is being addressed and a response to the crisis is found, modulated, modulating the form of responses in order to, re to shape them to the food crisis so that we can uh, offer 
protection to those who are most at risk from climate change. With the arrival of the new president, we have a new agricultural policy in place to combat one challenge, which the president has called a huge challenge, the challenge of eradicating uh, ill nutrition or malnutrition and hunger, and that is in relation to the dignity of the people of the country. It's a message for the entire population, and policy has been structured. We have called it the 3N uh, initiative, Nigerians Nourish Nigerians. So it's a long-term plan to put uh, the people of our country uh, in safety so that they won't be starving. And we want to improve their revenues by reinforcing national production capacities in terms of food and uh, supply of food to reinforce uh, resilience in face of food crises and natural catastrophes, to construct a sustainable food system that is sensitive to nutrition. The uh, framework of the initiative called 3N, adopted in 2012, has five guiding principles, mainly concentration of action and helping communes, villages, taking into account specific groups in actions, targeting to optimize investments, the sustainability of production by promoting sustainable ways of using natural resources and adapting to climate change. And there's also uh, giving everyone a sense of responsibility. So this strategy lays down five operational avenues for application, increasing and diversifying uh, crops, providing markets with uh, food and agro-food, increasing the resilience of uh, vulnerable groups, and improving uh, the protection of the state, and coordinating the sector and engaging reform. Each of these different avenues has its own strategic programs. And then we have a five-year plan, which is going to be implemented. We've had so far had two action plans, one for 2011 to 2015, and then one for 2016 to 2020, which is just finished. And now the 12 strategic programs are going to be applied by the different ministries participating in this 3N initiative. And the High com uh, Commission uh, that manages the 3N program, and that commission was appointed by the President, so that uh, commission will implement the program and the action plans. There's a budget for everything. And uh, we uh, report to the president and to all of the uh, ministers about progress, it, the progress of the uh, implementation. So there, we have a system of assessment has been put in place to identify progress which has been made and which remains to be made with uh, objectives so we can analyze how we're moving forward. Funding for the action plans, the five-year action plan is the, uh, annu is the state budget, it's uh, resources from NGOs, the private sector. Also, halfway through the action plan in 2014, it seemed uh, important to us that there was a lack of balance. We needed to readdress the uh, way finance was distributed. That's because 65% of the uh, resources used for the action plan was dedicated to financing humanitarian programs to at the detriment of longer term plans. And sometimes w without any link to the humanitarian needs in the country. So. Uh, uh, plan B was devised and the government decided to put up their acceleration plan for the 3N initiative to rebalance the funding to and, and address uh, those programs which were underfinanced. One of them is controlling water for our agricultural uh, use. but. 
we need to do what we can for the sea and for uh, forestry and uh, fishing and everything. So we have to control how we use our water. Secondly, restoring uh, land and combating uh, erosion by wind. And the third program is services to pro produ producers. Act three of our program focuses on uh, food safety and there's uh, the summit of Istanbul um, s placed uh, this issue at the very centre of the debate. The idea is to enhance the efficiency of humanitarian work and uh, tie that in with development work to identify national operational frameworks to reinforce local capacity to encourage peace. As in 2018, uh, we have been uh, speeding up the Nexus plan, setting up uh, high-level tripartite committees, including the different uh, players, and also we've been working in the different regions which are impacted by vulnerability, particularly in the east, which are victims of uh, Boko Haram, and in the west, victims of terrorism. To conclude, because I must uh, stop here, so we'll, there are many efforts, efforts in Niger to focus on sustainable food security. For, we have a we have several several plans in place, and we have uh, support from the AFD which uh, has launched a project which is just being started and this pilot project will ensure that the nexus is operational in Niger there has been a lot there have been a lot of humanitarian crises linked to climate change and civil insecurity and there've been displacement of people and there have been new pandemics such as covid this pilot uh, project will considerably enhance the coordination of uh, interventions in zones in difficulties and that ties up with all of the nexus uh, actions and it will constitute an accelerator to make the nexus program operational in Niger the second uh, initiative is a problem to is a is to contribute to the great green wall and I think this program which is going to be linked to the green wall is that of food security and that is being rolled out in the east of uh, Niger and since 2006 we have been speeding up the AFD work on the Great Green Wall so this is a major program and it means that we have been able to protect strategic zones for all kinds of agriculture it's a program which has increased and diversified uh, pro agricultural production and has also made it possible to set up uh, systems to ward off uh, conflicts and uh, other crises. The level of resilience of households, communities and ecosystems are being enhanced. So it's a great success story, this program, and that is why uh, we are happy that this program will continue to conclude. Since this uh, 3M policy has been put in place 10 years ago, with its action plans, the government has spent money, as have the partners, to fund the sector. And the goal which we were chasing to uh, get rid of uh, drought and famine, well, that has been achieved, and the government of Niger uh, has received congratulations from all the main uh, organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. High Commissioner. So, so thank you very much to our speakers. While the representatives of civil society and the scientists uh, get into position on the stage, I recommend that we take a look at a short film which describes a project which shows that we don't 
it's not only all about thoughts, it's all about action as well. En zone aride, la dégradation des terres est un problème majeur, accentué par les difficultés de gestion des espaces et des ressources naturelles. Usagers multiples de ces terres agricoles et ou pastorales, conflits autour de l'utilisation des ressources, difficultés de dialogue entre les différents acteurs. Autant de challenges à surmonter pour les collectivités dans la gestion de leur territoire. Au Sénégal, dans la zone agro-silvo-pastorale du Ferlot, les collectivités locales ont dû trouver des solutions pour améliorer et faciliter l'administration de leur territoire. Ainsi, la mise en place d'unités pastorales s'est révélée être une voie pertinente pour faciliter la planification territoriale. C'est ainsi le cas sur la commune de Tessékéré. Les populations s'organisent dans les UP, secteur par secteur, pour défendre l'environnement. L'UP est importante. C'est bon pour l'environnement, c'est bon pour l'éleveur et l'agriculteur. On s'organise, on choisit des hommes pour protéger la nature. Chacun a sa responsabilité dans l'UP. Et pour l'instant, cela fonctionne très bien. Avant la création des UP, les agents communaux n'avaient pas assez de moyens pour se déplacer et sensibiliser les populations quant à la destruction de la nature. Ils n'avaient pas de téléphone pour dénoncer les trafiquants de bois aux eaux et forêts. De plus, nous avions énormément de problèmes sur le déplacement des transhumants. En s'appuyant sur les unités pastorales, la commune de Tessékéré tente de faire perdurer ses ressources et de maintenir ses populations pastorales. Les outils que ce mode d'organisation met en place permettent de faciliter la gestion du territoire et des différents usagers des ressources. Mis en place sur plusieurs communes au Sénégal, ce mode d'organisation représente donc une voie certes imparfaite, mais malgré tout pertinente pour les zones à prédominance pastorale. Very good, thank you very much for that. So let's move on. I'm going to hand the floor to civil society, which is really committed to the project and will listen to what they have to recommend. So I'm going to um, invite two people up to the stage, Patrice Burger, president of CARI, and Sylvester Thiemtore, who is the uh, permanent secretary of the NGOs in Burkina Faso. They're going to uh, talk from their seats. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, hello, M ministers, I say hi to you as well, dear friends. It's great to hand the floor to civil society in this type of event because a lot of our organizations are, have been involved for a very long time in the question of uh, combating the degradation of uh, the land. This uh, Great Green Wall is a wonderful initiative for us in its principle, its vision, its geographical uh, scope, its territorial and transborder ambitions. It is unequaled in terms of scope. There is no such uh, business, uh, no such uh, project of such scope, I would like to underline here the added value of civil society organizations. They've been organized to uh, uh, deploy these uh, projects. They are already uh, uh, at the front fighting. One example is the Sahel Desertification Network. It's called RESAD. It's got four national platforms in Burkina, Mali, Niger, and in France. And they total 400 organizations that have been supported since 2010 by the AFD and have been involved since the very beginning in this initiative for the Great, Great Green Wall. In 2012 in Ouagadougou and then in also in Niger, Niger organizing uh, meetings, we realized that nobody was aware about this Great Green Wall in 2012. And then there were international uh, summits in 2017 and 2018, all about deserted actions in Strasbourg and Ouagadougou. And then 2017 and 2018, we've had uh, some projects such as reducing the gaps in the uh, Great Green Wall with the, U, with the IUCN or the uh, big uh, project about rivers. So 
Out on the field, nothing is possible without the participation of organized civil society at all levels of decision making and deployment. It, uh, their partners, like uh, everyone, uh, like any other partners, uh, civil society is involved in the smallest chain uh, link in the chain of territories, and uh, they uh, people trust them. They experiment, develop, adapt in a participative manner. They are pioneers. As, as has been proved on many, many occasions in Burkina and Senegal. And uh, the uh, Avaklim project, for example, which we're working on with scientists to identify the uh, added value of uh, agriculture. So their contribution is uh, very positive. Uh, their action is felt by the local populations. They work hands in hands with land workers to carry out a whole load of small local actions and they have expertise in the different territories uh, which can be uh, included in larger scale projects. So dear partners, the Great Green Wall is, uh, is starting now and it has to respond to high uh, challenges on the edges of the Sahara and all of them represent many, many threats in a region that is already under tension and uh, we, it, it could become unlivable unless we do something about it. But let's, succeeding this big wall is not an imperative for our morals, it is an imperative in short. It's a wonderful occasion to give concrete form to the strategic uh, document which France drew up and we contributed to. So we also have to ensure that there's coherency with other public policies so that we are not uh, undoing with our left hand what we are doing with our right hand. So that must all be in the past. The metaphor of the great green wall with uh, figures and uh, hundreds of thousands of, hundreds of millions of hectares and dollars and people People. It's all very powerful and it's driving a few people to be rather poetic about a, a new m marvel in the world. But for others it can be a bit confusing. Some people might imagine it's a big uh, barrier made up of trees or restoring just the land, but it's much more than that. It doesn't deserve too much honour or too much indignity. It needs more science. The rumour that is already being uh, going around about a lack of uh, clarity, of insufficient results, of fragmentation, dispersion, of la lacking in uh, governance and strategic leadership, competition between different players, is generating terrible messages is in the media. The strength of an initiative is the image which it can convey to one and all. The One Planet Summit and its accelerator offer a new unique opportunity but it also contains a an injunction to come up with a critical inventory of uh, the places and the people if we had to have a second lease of life. It's great to have a new uh, responsibility a new uh, framework, an accelerator is only efficient if the uh, cogs run smoothly. The conditions for uh, absorbing all of these investments where they are needed cannot be uh, decreed by law. We need to gather together the 16 billion that have been promised. We are determined to do it. And like President Macron, we will monitor those commitments. Finally, the accelerator has to focus on something very fundamental. It has to really mobilize the populations. The big, the Great Green Wall will exist when that great drum out in the bush from, can be heard from Dhaka to Djibouti and uh, tens of ethnic groups will, the Wolofs, the Tamacheks, the Pearl, the Mossi, the Dogons, the Sonikes, the Haritines and the Moros, the Afars and the Tigris, the Dingoes and the Igbo, when they are all singing from the same song sheet. In terms of developing the territories, geography is not only physical, economic or monetary, it is also human. We are together. Thank you. Now we, we don't have a lot of time, but we don't have a lot of time, but thank you very much for being here, everybody. I'd like to commend the book in a Minister for the Environment. Thank you very much for being here with us. I would just like to say that the Great Green Wall Initiative 
is, well, there's no doubt about it, it is a, an efficient tool. It is a tool that is holistic because it embraces several sectors, uh, development, uh, sustainable development, adapting to climate change, and protecting biodiversity, uh, to name but those. It will create jobs. So how can we make this accelerator efficient? For us in civil society, we have four proposals. The, there's got this great green wall, which offers all kind, which includes all kinds of players. Well, there's the state, the civil society. There are backers. You know, there are local councils, and sometimes the uh, players are just left on the edges of it all. So the first recommendation would be to reaffirm, to reconstruct, if you like, a real partnership between the state, civil society, research, technical and financial partners on the one hand, and on the other hand, with the other players involved. Because on um, this subject of partnership, the actors which we have been naming so far are all complementary. So it's important to work on subsidiarity and to make sure that we have all the tools and the necessary resources so that each player can play their role in full without any conflict so that the accelerator is a reality. The second recommendation that we would make is based on the principle of a coordination system. As you know, an accelerator is only efficient if the actors for whom the accelerator has been created are, up to, uh, are aware of the news. They know how important the initiative is. They know on which doors to knock to make sure that, uh, uh, that everything is efficient and so that uh, the mechanisms which are known and which are open and which enable, which makes the, the, sure that everyone can access uh, what they need to get access to. We'd also say that uh, mechanisms for supple funds be put in place to enable our players to have access to them. When you take a look at uh, the second pillar, it's great to want to restore land and to focus on the sustainable management of ecosystems. But if all of the players don't have access to resources, they don't have a mechanism that is uh, tailored to their capacities, then we are just going to be lagging behind. And finally, the fourth recommendation which we would formulate is linked to uh, this. We know that a lot of uh, uh, a lot of initiatives are nationwide and it's important to contribute all that all players in the land can contribute so we have to have an accelerator that recognizes the local collectivities and they have to be autonomous they have to be able to monitor what's going on and identify what um, progress is being made and we've got tools there when we uh, present uh, the forum of, of actions. We've got um, uh, different tools that we always use. These are levers which we can use to make sure that the accelerator is efficient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now let's hear what scientists have to say on this floor and I hope they are going to respect the time window. We have got with us Jean-Luc Schott with us who is uh, president of the French Scientific Committee on Diversity Action and Madame Astro Camara who's uh, a researcher at the Senegalese Institute of Agricultural Research. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, ministers, uh, executive secretaries of the uh, UNCTD. Uh, dear friends of the Great Green Wall, since the Great Green Wall was launched, the international scientific community has been on board to try and come up with uh, scientific proof on the impact of this wall on a, on a local scale and on an international scale. Uh, it was designed as one of the main vectors for combating uh, the degradation of uh, land in the Sahel. The Great Green Wall is, a part, is according to me, uh, will help to solve two problems on a local scale, to uh, reinforce the uh, local population's resilience and enhance their well-being, and also on a local scale to 
work towards a uh, world where uh, the degradation of the earth is, is in neutral, which is uh, SDG number 50. Yet, l tying the global and the local together has several block blockages, and science has to get rid of these blockages. Science has to take uh, uh, solid scientific proof to help with decision taking on a global sale scale. The uh, science policy interface, the UNCCD, has got involved in doing this in France, and this is uh, quite unique and it's worth underlining. We have the French Scientific Committee for Desertification, desi or designed by the uh, Ministry for Europe and uh, foreign affairs, ecological transition and uh, higher education is all involved in here. Research has to document the Great Green Wall in territories and also be in a position to put forward innovations and it also has a, a, a duty to identify the blockages so that they need to be removed so that we can speed up the wall and to according to the the scientific community, it means that we have to enhance interdisciplinarity. If science um, embraces the Great Green Wall and subjects of, uh, to do with the, por the forest, it is now um, analyzing the inclusive management of territories. And to achieve this, we have to open up a whole wide range of scientific expertise to focus on uh, real estate, um, water relationships and degradation of land and conflict, nature uh, and uh, the uh, link between climate, biodiversity and land. It's also a question of reinforcing trans disciplines. Science has to be hybrid in its approach to knowledges and, and cross-pollinate with other knowledges in a participative approach. So what must science do to connect the global and the local? It seems to me that science has to be in a position to put its knowledge uh, and make it available for the production of indicators. The politics and science interface uh, has also uh, put forward several indicators which have been accepted. The carbon stock stored in the ground, the coverture of the ground and the primary production so these are all indicators. They have to in, they have to document uh, uh, all impacts. However, we cannot help with bring out this great green wall if we are not in a capacity to monitor and assess compromises and synergies that the wall has on food security and human well-being, i.e., poverty, biodiversity, climate, resources in water, and the quality of the ground. We will not be able to uh, proceed if we cannot create a model in time and space of these different compromises and synergies. Action today can have a negative effect in the short term, but it can, in the medium or long term, turn out to be a very efficient solution for the pollution, the populations. Uh, monitoring and assess and. Uh, assessment needs all kinds of tools that need to be developed locally and also for the entire Great Green Wall. Everyone agrees that there is a lack of suitable data to help decision making by putting forward indicators and methods for measuring, collecting, archiving and sharing uh, these, these information. Science will bring a solution and we will be able to come up with uh, such great projects and uh, target priorities and find the right financing. So there's a few words of introduction. I'm now going to hand the floor to my colleague Astu Kamara. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Authorities, uh, dear participants, it is uh, true that there are different actions that are the crossroads of research and development, and that could serve as uh, levers for implementing the Great Green Wall. I'm talking about levers because they could contribute to the implementation of the Great Green Wall and supplement the, its approach. The research approaches are complementary on the geographical point of view. Indeed, they are implemented on areas that are outside of the Great Green Wall. But as you know, there's a desertification, there's de deforestation, there's a a lot of them in, on our territory away from the Great Green Wall. 
And these approaches are also complementary on when it comes to methodology because these approaches um, put focus on uh, guidance for farmers providing guidance to uh, farmers so that they can develop sustainable production techniques that will help them face challenges on the field. They are, uh, there are different uh, approaches used. Uh, uh, there are different approaches as for the uh, resource uh, management. And that's uh, the case uh, in our region too. So these initiatives have been supported by research, by uh, research partnerships in the region, and more especially in West Africa. These initiatives want to respond to challenges in food, in food insecurity, and the degradation of lands, and this res this research is interdisciplinary as Jean-Luc said they are opened on to other sectors and they are also transversal I would like to give you three examples of a project who are a research who is underway and that will give you an example of the uh, action and action and, and research measures we are uh, moving forward so here's the first uh, example. It is a project called Fair Sahel and aims to promote agroecology in the region. It, uh, this uh, project is active at different levels uh, and this is in line with the different challenges we want to respond to. So the first uh, level is the family uh, farms. Our people work with uh, farmers in their own parcels and they try and improve their techniques in a sustainable way. This project is also carried out by collectivities. Uh, so uh, the collectivities can identify uh, sources of change levers who uh, will uh, help them invert trends. This is an innovative uh, project because it's also active at the national and regional level. There are four countries involved, among them Burkina Faso and Senegal. And in these uh, four countries, uh, we uh, want to involve political actors and we want to build a public policy that are uh, based on the result uh, we obtain at the local level. I'd like to uh, talk about another project which is uh, similar because it is uh, financed by the same initiative and it, uh, uh, it, it fits the One Health approach. And on this second project, we uh, aim to uh, reach a territorial approach. So we are looking for a lever for the Great Green Wall. And as you can see, this uh, project involved the same uh, partners in the south and in the north, and the same, uh, the same uh, development partners. They uh, want to uh, promote the interconnection of uh, uh, human health, animal health, and the health of the ecosystem. This project has already started. It is innovative because it is. Uh, based on living labs that is a local uh, laboratories that combine research and uh, local civil uh, society so that local actors can be uh, active can lead uh, um, lead the way so that uh, we can find a technical scientific and financial solutions to uh, the problems so Again, we uh, this is a really transversal approach because we face complex issues, so we need a multifaceted point of view uh, so that we can better respond to challenges and find solutions. So that's the reason uh, why uh, we have many different actors working together. But on the geographical point of view, view, we are close to the Great Green Wall, at least for Senegal. And let me give you a third example of uh, our project. Uh, here, uh, this project is based on uh, carbon capture and on greenhouse gases. This project 
is uh, really close to the Great Grey Wall or similar because this project is uh, implemented on an area across which goes the Great Green Wall. It aims to produce a benchmark data from a livestock breeding in the region. The IPCC uses specific data to assess the methane that it produced by livestock. And these data doesn't come from the Sahel region. It comes from different, uh, uh, different livestock systems. So uh, research has shown that a extensive uh, livestock, extensive uh, breeding uh, produces a lot of methane. And here what we find is that there is a balance between methane um, emissions and carbon capture. So this project was financed so we can uh, move forward. We can go further. Uh, above all, on the technical point of view, we will reinforce our capacities and we will still work with community, local communities, so that we can implement a share, uh, shared resources and models. And if I have to tell you something tonight is that I would say that we need new approaches that will take local uh, population needs into account and we need approaches that are inclusive and approaches that they won't perceive as a restriction that won't generate conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Camara. I know you had much more to say, and that is really difficult to uh, uh, to keep things short. And uh, now I would like to uh, start the third section of our session. We are talking about uh, means, about uh, funding. Please, uh, dear speakers, I invite you to come over and take your seats. Thank you. I hope the translation worked. And what I really appreciated is this uh, work uh, carried uh, jointly, and that really shows that we are a transversal uh, challenges. And now, over to uh, Sami on you that will talk about what has been done in the cell. Thank you very much. Mr. Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs, Madam Minister, for the environment and uh, durable development of Mauritania, and Minister for the Great Green Wall, Executive Secretary of the United Nations to combat desertification, Mr. High Commissioner of the 3N Initiative in Niger, colleagues here on the panel, the participants. We've heard some wonderful things said this afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, to be uh, uh, part of this amazing movement. We're bringing back life, we're bringing back nature and hope to the Great Green Wall in Africa, from Dakar to Djibouti. Governments and communities have got on board to reaffirm that the future of the Earth is also ours. The World Bank wants to be a key partner in this effort. If no action is taken, 70 million people will suffer in the Sahel between now and 2050. 27 million could migrate or to escape from climate change. We have to turn things around. The World Bank has committed to fund 63 projects for $7.5 billion to support this Great Green Wall initiative in eight member states. Since the One Planet Summit in January 2021, the World Bank has 
come a long way despite the fact that we've had a pandemic to cope with. Projects for billions of dollars are, al are already uh, being deployed. New projects for $1.4 billion have been approved. And exchanges, discussions are underway with uh, partners and countries to pool our knowledge, to mobilize our funding and to reinforce dialogue beyond our borders. Our actions are not new. Since two uh, between 2012 and 2020, the World Bank has uh, launched the SAWAP, it's a program for the Sahel and West Africa, supporting the, grand, the Great Wall with two billion uh, invested and great results. Six million hectares are under threat of desertification. They've been rehabilitated and seven billion will be uh, spread around nine countries. We have learnt some good lessons, including the need to work with science to better understand ecosystems, to identify technologies that are the most relevant so that we can measure impacts. As our research colleagues, colleagues have said, Jean-Luc Schott said those very words. So we also have proof that restoration of land is a profitable activity. It improves living conditions. It makes it easier to capture carbon and it helps combat the harmful effects of climate change. But as this morning, one of my colleagues said this morning from the, the World Bank, when you uh, take a look at what we've achieved, we have to say that the work is far from over. Nothing is going to be easy, given that there's such a huge amount of land involved, given all the funding that is needed, the geographical complexities, and the difficulty of putting in place transversal actions. However, we will manage. Allow me to thank France for its support to the World Bank and for the uh, sustainable development of Africa. We are working to promote healthy ecosystems and resilient communities. Dear partners, more than, a, more than a curtain of trees, this great green wall is a corridor for growth, opportunity and hope. Each and every one of us, whether we're financial backers, governance, members of youth, members of so civic society, we are all going to be the stones that make up this great green wall. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much uh, for, to the World Bank. Uh, we hope the audience isn't uh, too tired to have noted the lovely photos that have been on the screen behind me. I'm now going to hand the floor to Remy Ryu, he is Director General of the French Development Agency, a financial partner, and uh, they're going to, uh, he's going to say a few words now. Thank you very much, Philippe. Good evening, everybody. It's an honor for me to be with you, ladies and gentlemen. In Niger, we had the High Commissioner from Niger, who was talking about pastoral ground being reduced that it can be uh, rather insecure, be not very much security in certain patches. So we are delighted to build with you uh, the Bumkasa Pihu uh, project on pastoral lands, which aims to use uh, science of the commons that was uh, mentioned to uh, mark out a thousand square kilometers of pastoral land, 4,000 kilometers of transhumance uh, col corridors, 72 water points. And since 2019, 59 million euros have been spent in your country also uh, to give access to basic services and I think this is very concrete proof. In Burkina Faso, Mr. Minister, the serial deficit uh, 
it is chalked up one in every four years. We know how difficult it is for displaced people for your government. It's quite a, a headache. And we at the AFD are very proud to work with you on a project which is called Secure Agri. It's a project in the East region to develop uh, land restoration, to introduce, intro, to introduce innovative uh, agricultural uh, techniques. We're working with the farm workers to come up with answers. So I think this great green wall is that precisely. We got involved in January last year to contribute 600 million euros over the next few years. Our colleagues have already explained, and I would like to commend their presence, the Green Firm. That, so we all know how ambitious we all are, so it's a bit of a signal here. We're going to do more. We're going to launch more, product, more projects. But we're here to speed things up and to take stock. And I believe that to go beyond this question of volume and, and numbers, which of course is at the, the foundations, we are going to have to progress in the coming weeks and months. And it's already been said by previous speakers, we're going to have to improve governance and the steering of these different projects. Madam Minister, your presidency of the uh, agency, the Great Green Wall Agency, is so very important. We really do need this uh, effective framework for political um, piloting and to coordinate all of our different institutions. A second point I'd like to underline, it's already been said, of course, different communities, civil society, all players must uh, feel uh, in charge. We have to stand by their sides. We have to listen to them. And in all of these coordination mechanisms, we have to ensure that we integrate the institutions in the Sahel, i.e. civil society institutions, uh, public institutions, but also financial institutions. And uh, uh, I don't like the word, but there are these backers, and I don't really like that word, but they're public development banks, for example, that get involved. But let's not forget our brothers and sisters at local public banks. We're familiar with the uh, National Agricultural Development Bank in Mali. I think that's the only one today that can work in the red zone and uh, can take our funding all the way through to the land workers, to the uh, agriculturists. So with uh, the IFAD, we are going to be having a big uh, meeting in Rome. It's called Financing in Common. And it involves all the public development banks. And I really do hope we're going to focus on the Great Green Wall. And we're going to talk about how we can get the African banking institutions involved in our efforts. And the final point, apologies for taking up so much time. And this has always already been said again. There is a big question. Well, I'm a bit frustrated, really. Uh, the AFD has never been more involved in the Sahel, never spent more. There are so many operations going on um, organized by the French Development Agency, and people don't know. There's no transparency there. There's no visibility. So I think we should all work together. Either, either that's not true and people do know what we're doing, or we do have a collective problem. Of course, it's never enough given what the problems are, but I think it's important that we get public opinion in, Sah Sah in the Sahel. We want them to know what's happening. Uh, it's, it's above and beyond my capacity. I, it's not my role, it's a political role. It's for the media 
if Ibrahim is still, uh, whether this is a question of, uh, of totting things up and uh, publicizing what we're doing in the Sahel. And if we manage to do that, if we can manage all together, then I think the things that we're saying here in Marseille, talking about protecting nature and the well-being of the populations to develop the economy and society, then we mustn't well, it is possible in the Sahel, and we can demonstrate that really easily. It's always been true that development and nature go hand in hand. We may have forgotten it over here in the West, but over there you haven't forgotten that. So I think that could be a very strong message. And I think, uh, and here's another one of my frustrations, we would perhaps to smash that image that we have of the Sahel. There's a lot of work going on to try and change the narrative, to use that trendy word, the narrative, change how we perceive the, the Sahel. There's a big problem in terms of security in the Sahel, of course, but for over 10 years now, uh, it is the region, so the Sahel is the region in Africa which has the biggest growth rate. Nobody knows that. There are problems too, perhaps, perhaps because there is wealth there. So uh, I'm really calling out to you all, how can we all together, we've got this great green wall, which is a very big, beautiful, strong project. How can we use it, for example, to change perceptions? And let's be very concrete about this. Let's see what is happening on the ground, what we've all got in our, in our files. And I think if we manage to do that, then uh, you know, we'll make a huge step forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Remy, for those words. Of course, yes, there are frustrations and there are expectations also. And I think our take home message from this session, which has been a bit longer than was planned, but the, it was important that all of the speakers had a chance to express uh, their messages. That's what the uh, uh, IUCN uh, conference is all about. I think it will motivate everybody and uh, I was at a workshop earlier on and when I turned up here, the minister was uh, taking, was apologizing because they had to catch a plane. And so sent me to a workshop on the Great Blue Wall, organized by small island states, saying that it's great what you're doing with your Great Green Wall. We want to have a Great Blue Wall. I didn't dare tell them about all of the difficulties we were encountering. I didn't want to discourage them. But let's move forward. And then once we've got some experience, then we can share our experience with you. But uh, so it, everybody's got their eyes on us. So we had thought we'd do questions and answers, but I think it would be better if we all get a drink. Uh, we're all hot as if we were in the desert. We need a drink. So thank you everyone for being here.